This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. TNA is the best wrestling in the whole world. Oh, shit! It's Vince Russo! Oh, yeah, you could be king, king, king of these mess. You know what I'm saying? I am the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels. Cousin. That's about some unadulterated bullshit. This is BS. This sucks. I've lost my objectivity and I don't give a damn. Welcome everybody to You've Got To Be Kidding Me, episode number 16, where we go through TNA history one month at a time. This week covering TNA in September 2003. I'm Garrett Kidney. I'm joined as always by my co-host Liam Jones. Liam, howdy. Howdy ho. Cowboy emoji in your direction. Yeehaw. You having yourself a good week? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why not? I've, I've been sick all week. That doesn't help. So that hasn't been fun. Sick of TNA, is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh, surprisingly not this week, no. <laughs> Sorry, this month, no. Well, that's always nice. It's always nice when you come out of a TNA, but very enthusiastic for TNA. Listen, I never said very enthusiastic. You're putting words in my mouth now. What I think I heard you say was, this is the best thing you've ever seen in the history of wrestling. And you're like, God, why wasn't I here in 2003 as a six-year-old watching NWA TNA being like, blowing my mind and changing my vision of wrestling forever? No, you see, you got that mixed up because I was watching All Japan Women's Today. And I was legitimately saying something along those lines. Why wasn't I born earlier? (laughs) I was born two years too late. I should have been a, a wee bab watching my Aja Kong matches. <laughs> Doing your tape trading to get your Aja Kong matches? Yeah, I should <laughs> I should have been tape trading out of the womb. So anything else going on with you other than your illness? No. Uh, I watched Hamilton. Woo! Uh, so you're very politically active now. Yes, I am an activist. You're steeped in the, the founding of America. Uh... Yeah, I, I, my, my favourite part of Hamilton was... Go on. The Hamilton heel turn. Oh, spoilers, by the way. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Been out forever. <laughs> well, a heel turn is like a very vague terminology. Mm-hmm. Could be a light heel turn, could be a, a full-blown... Trying to think of someone who turned heel recently on NWA TNA. Frankie Kazarian. Could be a Frankie Kazarian heel turn. He hasn't turned heel yet. We're just He's laying the seeds for his heel turn. I disagree. Okay. <laughs> There's been a lot of big turns. A Trinity heel turn. Ah, yes, the the, the ultimate heel turn, to- turning on Goldilocks, and Goldilocks hasn't been seen since, so... I assume she's... Well, she's been brokenhearted, I assume. Trinity probably killed her. Oh, no. I hope not. <laughs> just took her out. Jesus, that's brutal. Go- like, Goldilocks came back just to get, like, bullied for one week, and then she left again. And then we forgot to mention that segment on the episode and Goldilocks was so upset at that slight that she just said, I'm not coming back. In 2003, she knew. Mm. She's like, in 19 years, some dudes are going to sit on a podcast and ignore my segment. So what's even the point of doing it? Exactly. What, um, what pop culture things have you been involved with? What, um, early 20. Well, uh, not early, but what 2010s pop culture phenomenons have you just gotten around to now? Oh, what have I been doing this week? I've been watching CSI. That's a much earlier than early 2010s. Yeah, so it's a bit culture. earlier. That's from 2000. So I'm watching pop culture even older than this NWA TNA. Yeah. <laughs> learning how to solve crimes while you're learning how to found a republic. I always knew. <laughs> History had its eye on me, Garrett. You're not going to miss your shot or whatever the lyric from that song is. I'm not going to miss my shot. Because I'm young, scrappy, and, and hungry. <laughs> Just ah, like my country. Shout out to Scrappy from last week. Yeah, this is full. So this is long-term podcast storytelling. This is callbacks. What more do you want from a podcast? It's like wrestling. It's all that really matters. <laughs> Alright, there's literally nothing going on in our lives. You might as well get into the episode. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, like, my, my only other peak was I played Arceus Legends for like an hour. <laughs> and you got very mad at the tutorial. God, just every Pokemon game. Just let me skip it. <laughs> have like a have you played a Pokemon game ever before option and lets me skip the first hour of the game. 
there was kind of that in Sword of Shield. There was a bunch of stuff. It's like, uh, do you want to know about this? And then you're like, no. And it's like, fine. Or if you, there was the catching tutorial where you actually had Pokeballs and could catch a Pokemon. And if you did, they're like, oh, I see you caught a Pokemon. Let's just get past that. I, I Don't tell me about the story. I don't care. And don't teach me the basics. I don't care. Just throw me out into the wilderness and let me survive. But they do basically, you know, basically ignore the tutorial and wander around. Yeah, but like then you can only catch like shinks and shit. You know, I want to, I want to move out into the big world. There's an alpha Snorlax there, so you can get your ass kicked by. I, I saw an, I did, it did kick my ass. <laughs> I, I got my ass kicked by an alpha Rapidash as well. Did you get notions? You're like, I can take it. I tried. I threw one ball at it. <laughs> that just fucked your shit up. Yeah, if I had have had the heavy ball, I would have done it. Mm. Master your stealth. You played Metal Gear. You know how to do stealth. Yeah, yeah. I, it is very Metal Gear. This is the part of my brain, right? Mm-hmm. That is my, like, uh, when my kid Pokemon brain, where it's like, the fact that I have to catch multiple of the same Pokemon kills me. Why? Because I'm one and done, baby. <laughs> I'm loyal. You can still only use the one and done. Yeah, but I don't want to catch 20 Bidoof. Who does not want to catch 20 Bidoof? And my question is, are we catching all these Pokemon to explain why, like, Pokemon are, like, subservient in the future. It's like, this one kid came in and caught a thousand Pokemon in three days, and we overthrew the Pokemon. We tamed the wilds. Is it, like, legitimately, right? That's what it is. And then they give all those Pokemon out to people or something, and then that's how Pokemon trainers begin. I do quite like the the whole story setup, where everybody is, like, scared shitless of Pokemon. It's funny, because it's, like, the first time they admit it, they're like, yeah, Pokemon will murder you. It's like, we, we do not like them. They are terrifying. It's quite, like, a terrifying premise because there's one city. <laughs> it's like, the human race is so outgunned by these things that we have been restricted to one area and can't go any further. And anytime we go outside, we're absolutely horrified that we'll have interactions with these evil giant monsters that will fuck our shit up if we come across this alpha Snorlax. Yeah, um, I haven't seen any of the new forms that I hadn't already seen from trailers. Hmm. So I'm still looking forward to that. I picked Rowlet. Of course. I wanted to pick Cyndaquil, but I kind of have an idea what Cyndaquil looks like. I mean, the Typhlosion. So I was like, I'll go with Rowlet then. Of the three, I've now evolved all three, or seen all three evolutions even. I don't like Typhlosion, and I think the other two are kind of cool. Yeah. I don't like Oshawott. Mm. Oshawott. Yeah, I don't like that Pokemon very much, because it was just too much like Piplup. <laughs> I was like, it's like the same proportions. <laughs> but it has a little shell. That it does moves with. I don't know. I like Piplup more. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Piplup is in this game, so you can catch a Piplup somewhere. Dope. I want a Piplup. Yeah, so that's Liam's Pokemon update. Yeah, I'm sure people were. Were chomping at the bit for it. I watched a lot of my, um, my, these are the matches I've, I'm already behind on. <laughs> <laughs> that's always a fun list in pro wrestling, because there's never not pro wrestling. There's always so goddamn much of it. And you're like... Uh, I don't even really want to watch this one, but I feel like I have to so I can watch all the other stuff. What was the match that I told you? Just like, I'm not even going to pretend I'm going to watch recently. Osprey and Oku. Yeah, I'm just not going to do it. I'm like, no, sorry. It's a hell of an atmosphere. I'm just going to move on. Mm. Also, it's like 40 minutes, isn't it? It kind of flies, though. Still. Like, it's not like a New Japan main event where there's a crowd that can't make noise 40 minutes. It's like a hot 40 minutes. Still, like I'm, I I can watch forty minutes if I'm watching something live. But like the idea of committing forty minutes to a wrestling match now, like on tape, I'm just like, no. Yeah, I know it's a good, it's probably a match you should check out by the end of the year. But you know, forty minutes is a big uh, hurdle. Mm. I don't even think it's forty. I think it's thirty something, but oh. it's close enough to forty. <laughs> All right, that brings us to September 2003 in the NWA TNA. A- an interesting month, some very big news notes, which we'll get into in a minute, even though it was only a three-show month because we had the one-cent pay-per-view. Mm. And we watched that one-cent pay-per-view, of course, and we'll be reviewing it. All right, we'll start with the one-cent pay-per-view, actually, because it's interesting. We'll start with the match card for it. So, oh God, I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> the the one-cent pay-per-view, September 10, 2003, was... A, a two-hour special uh, available for one cent on most pay-per-view providers, even though some pay-per-view providers didn't change the price, so it was still $10 for some pay- uh, pay-per-view. I wonder how many people bought that. Bought it for 10 Yeah. Some people probably did. And to be fair, it's probably a better show than most TNA pay-per-views at that point. That's true. It has most of the better matches. 
So it included the first Ultimate X match, the AMW Triple X Steel Cage match, the Gathering versus New Church Clockwork Orange match, Jarrett and Raven, Styles against Jarrett and Raven, uh, Jarrett and Sting against Styles and Waltman, the Styles and D-Lo Cage match, and the Wednesday Bloody Wednesday match that we will talk about when we cover the September 3rd show. Um, an interesting choice of matches. I, I'm interested to see that there's nothing from 2002, so I think they wanted a more contemporary vision of what TNA looked like. They should have put the X Cup finals in there instead of the Wednesday Bloody Wednesday. It was a much better match, but I guess boy, I get why they put their main eventers in there as opposed to putting in Hoovy and Saban. You have all the main eventers all throughout it anyway, you know? Like, the lack of X Division like, representation is, I think, the biggest note when I look at this lineup on the show. Like, there's one match, there's Ultimate X, and then the X Division is gone entirely. There's no more X Division stuff. Yeah, there's no um, AJ, Lynn. Mm, or like I would have put the first X title match, especially because that match took place in front of like a 3,000 full crowd. So I think it would leave a good impression. But uh, I guess what you said, like you said, they wanted to give you an idea of like what the current TNA is. Yeah, all the matches were introduced by Mike Tanay and Don West. They had wraparounds. They had the video packages where relevant. And then the show ended with a push to uh, Raven against Shane Douglas in the hair versus hair match the week following. So like they did try to sell you on coming back the week after. So, like, I, I, there's some matches I wouldn't have included, like Styles D'Lo in the cage is probably a match I wouldn't have included. I think there's better matches you could put in there. I don't know, that match is silly, and I would appreciate it if it was on my... And it's, like, four minutes long. You you just want it there because Eric Watts is involved, and you need people exposed to Watts. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, like you said, you gotta put all the stars on the show. <laughs> Yeah, Russo, you get Watts. Yeah. Gathering versus the New Church. I, I, again, I get why it's there and like who it represents and who it represents in the show. But a weird match to include. Even though it is a good match, it's a fun match. Mm. I guess they probably just wanted to like get the, the Gathering in there and to get like... Was Douglas in that match as well or was it just pure New Church? It was Douglas. Yeah, and to get Douglas on there too. It's probably important to get Douglas versus Raven on there in some way, considering the whole end of it was them hyping up the Herbert Sair match. This was that TNA wants to expose thousands, if not tens of thousands of wrestling fans to their style of wrestling for the first time. To do that, they purchased ad time during Raw on cable systems across the country, plugging their one-cent pay-per-view this Wednesday. The plug doesn't actually have any, any matches, but does show Sting, Raven, Jarrett, Styles, and Sandman, even though Sandman didn't end up being in the special, among other TNA-featured wrestlers. Jeremy Borash does the voiceover stating it's the style of wrestling you won't see on Monday nights. Oh, shots, Liam, shots fired. Heavy shot at dark. <laughs> Pay-view isn't live, but instead features a best of format featuring all the matches we mentioned there. Imagine if it was live and it was just all the same matches, but done again. In front of an empty arena. Do it. <laughs> just... Yeah. No, it's just a very confused group of fans. Reenacting each match move for move. I like it better if it's all different mo- matches completely. Like, they rework it completely. Have different finishes. Or it's like inside the actor studio, but for wrestling, where they'll do the move and then they'll turn to the camera. It's like, so we did this because we wanted you to feel... <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would watch that. <laughs> mm. TNA hopes those who see the best of show this Wednesday will be convinced to order future two-hour live pay-per-views on upcoming Wednesday nights. A lot is riding on this week's ad campaign and one-cent pay-per-view and drawing future paying customers. Wow. So not only did they take out ads on Raw, they also handed out flyers for their one-cent pay-per-view the fans outside Huntsville, Alabama, where WWE had an event. I wonder how many WWE fans tuned in. I mean, they probably, well, if they had the flyers of those guys on it, they're probably like, oh, Jarrett, Sting, Raven, WCW's back? <laughs> WWA is back? <laughs> yeah, but they, they're all big fans of um, the WWA card, and they're like, all right, let's go. I see Road Dog. that's all I need. <laughs> I see Hoovy. So the estimates, and take these with a considerable grain of salt, were that the show did around 100,000 buys. Hell yes. Dave Meltzer later clarifies that that I think that number comes from the fact that it did 10 times higher buys in a lot of key markets. So it, it, that, that where they usually do 10,000, they did 10 times better. So they're like extrapolating that out to be about 100,000. But if they did do 10 times better in markets, that's a lot of people buying the show. It, it's at least... A decent number of people sampling, even if, obviously, if 100,000 people buy the show for a cent, that means you just made $1,000. Do we ever find out the numbers for the shows immediately after the one-set pay-per-view? There is no th- nothing in the notes 
So we'll see. There was no like rise in attendance or anything, so they didn't get that kind of bump. The attendance was pretty flat afterwards, actually. Uh, I doubt how many people are the how many of the locals are buying that. You know, I don't know. I would be like, oh, it would be fun to revisit some of the best matches because obviously this is a not an era where it's impossible to track these shows down. But like, you can't just download the show and watch your Triple X against AMW match again. Yeah, they have to do their trade taping with Baby Me. Exactly. They're like, I'll give you this triple X AMW tape in exchange for your Aja Kong All Japan Women's tapes. And I said, no way, mate. <laughs> the one set pay per view was their their big swing. We'll we'll see did it tur- turn out to do anything. But like, if if I'm about ten times better than usual, bought the show. That's exposure you weren't getting, even if you made no money back from it immediately. Yeah. Michael Shane told the interactive interview show that his career highlight to this point is winning the exhibition title in an Ultimate X match. He was offered a chance to wrestle in Ultimate X or a ladder match, but chose Ultimate X because he ladder matches are are kind of getting killed lately. He says this in 2003, by the way, when it was <laughs> like ladder matches were still relatively fresh in 2003. Nah, uh, I, I, we need to get Michael Shane in um, the major companies now, mm. so he can he can think of something else. You can point out all the goddamn ladder matches that happened in NXT. Yeah. He said he plans to sign the TNA contract soon, which would lock him into TNA and prevent him a jump to WWE for the next two years. Do you think that was him, like, putting feelers out, being like, I'm going to sign this contract soon? Well, we'll talk about, like, WWE interest in all those wrestlers and whether or not TNA signed all those contracts in a little bit. But, yeah, probably. It's like, listen, if you want to come, come now. (laughs) Yeah. Send me a message. I would like to jump, Sean. Cousin? Cousin? Did you know that Sean Michaels is Michael Shane's cousin? (laughs) Clearly not enough of a cousin to get him a job in the world wrestling entertainment. I'm going to start referring to Sean Michaels as Michael Shane's cousin. You should, and people will be very confused, and rightfully so. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, um, WrestleMania 25, that had the really good match with Michael Shane's cousin. (laughs) Goldilocks told the Mayhem Radio Show that she is looking forward to eventually returning to TNA, but she feels she has heat for swearing on the air and losing her cool sometimes. And for having not a great prank segment. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it's the best thing in TNA history, though. Goldilocks walking into phone stores, shouting at people for five minutes. <sighs> Sorry, I just read the names in the next note, and just, like, I thought we were back in the 2010 Monday Night Wars. Oh, I have some fun with that one. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But I, uh, Goldilocks, there's a, a Roddy Piper segment on these shows, a, a taped Roddy Piper interview, that is like the most delirious, unhinged, like I- incomprehensible nonsense you've ever seen, other than Goldilocks' <laughs> segment in that phone shop. Definitely had to be edited more than a Goldilocks segment. It sure did. They edited the goddamn heck out of that thing. I, I couldn't even like make heads or tails of what it was supposed to be. And if you imagine like... That's the sense they tried to make of it edited. What the hell was it like if uh, if they just ran the tape? It was, like, nothing made sense. He wasn't speaking incoherent thoughts. He wasn't making, like, anything a resembling <laughs> a point. Yeah, it's just... It's just Roddy, what's wrong? Mm. We'll get to that. We'll get to Roddy. But speaking of Roddy, one of his career rivals, Liam, Hulk Hogan... Bubba the Love Sponge. Oh. <laughs> Hulk Hogan appeared on the Bubba the Love Sponge radio show in Florida and said that he spent some time talking with TNA officials about the possibility of working for the promotion. There is actually a good chance he will agree to make at least one appearance, although some sources consider the negotiations to be posturing on Hogan's part. Others believe he and TNA are close enough on financial terms that he will come in for a one-time appearance. How much do you think that costs? (laughs) Oh god, a one-off Hogan appearance? It's gotta be like north of 10k, right? Uh... I think far north. I think you're doubling that. Because Hogan would have been working in Japan at this stage, so... I think you're getting, like, 20k for that. Easy. Mm, Because apparently Piper was looking for five just to do angles. Yeah. So when you consider Hogan is a bigger star than Piper in 2003. It's an interesting one. The meeting between TNA officials and Hulk Hogan was on September 12th in Tampa, Florida. Hogan, Jimmy Hart, and Jeff and Jerry Jarrett were present. The hope is Hogan would get them a TV deal, which they still believe would be the best move for the long-term solvency of the company. Jerry Jarrett's optimism that wrestling fans and the TV industry were ready for a pay-per-view weekly series has soured, especially because the pay-per-view distributor in demand has been, for the most part, so organized and unsupportive, despite early promises of the opposite. Unorganized and unsupportive. Oh yes, I said organized. It's the opposite. <laughs> So, they want Hogan, Liam. They want Hulk Hogan. Listen, I don't blame them. Mm-hmm. Obviously, 
like the biggest name in the history of the U.S. wrestling scene. You, I mean, it's, it's 2003 has a lot of value still. Um, would pop a big number. Um, unfortunately, it'd probably just be some sort of Vince Russo <laughs> segment. <laughs> Well, well, we'll get to that. He's currently suing Vince Russo for things that happened in WCW, so... Maybe they keep them separate. Maybe that's one of those uh, random episodes where it's like, oh, Russo isn't here this week. Because what was a Bash at the Beach 2000? The, 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 the Hogan-Jarrett segment where Jarrett laid down for Hogan? I'm not sure. I don't know WCW history. Because that segment was a work shoot where, where Jarrett was meant to be defending the belt against Hogan. Jarrett walked out, laid down for Hogan. Hogan looked flabbergasted. That's how it was supposed to play out, but then Vince Russo came out and cut a promo on Hogan calling him a useless piece of shit, and Hogan was not best pleased, so he ended up suing them. I was going to say, because he had, like, creative control in his contract. Mm. So it's, it's typical WCW, where it was a worked shoot that worked itself into a shoot. No, well, to be fair, the work shoot didn't work itself into a shoot. It was the guy shooting, <laughs> mm. who just decided to do it. <laughs> So uh, we'll talk about that in a second with our next note about the, how the, the the next thing we're going to talk about might be influenced by the fact that they are trying to get Hulk Hogan in. But yeah, like that, the idea is to do that match again. It's to do Hogan and Jarrett, which, yeah. which I'm not sure anybody in the world really wants. But you know what? It's it's the only who else would you do with Hogan? Hogan and AJ? <laughs> yeah, like it makes no. Yeah, you do Jarrett and Hogan mm-hmm. teaming up against Russo and AJ. I just book Hogan and Dusty. That was exactly what went through my mind after the words came out of my mouth. <laughs> it's just like, why not? Just book Hogan and Dusty. Yeah, they're like Hogan, Hogan, Sting, and Raven <laughs> versus Jared, AJ, and Russo, <laughs> and Dusty. It, and Dusty's the special guest referee. And Eric Watts is chained to Russo. Yeah, and Eric Watts is the enforcer. Russo, Russo just has a Watts on his arm at all times, despite the fact that he's wrestling. <laughs> And uh, Tree LK is your ring announcers, because that's a thing we do these days, apparently. I do a Jerry Lynn versus Hulk Hogan. <laughs> the true TNA ace, Jerry Lynn. Yeah. Hogan versus Disco, you could do that. You could do that. You could do Hogan versus Mad Mikey. Oh, that might be good. Um, Hogan versus Kid Cash, obviously, the legend gimmick. Or Hogan against Abyss. Yeah, well, he beats Abyss, obviously foreshadowing the 2010 stuff yeah. with the Hogan and Abyss. Let's get off this subject. <laughs> we will be talking about more about Hogan in the coming episodes of this show, and I'm sure you want to hear lots more about Hulk Hogan. I think I know what that's about. Yeah, well, this this story rolls on all the way to 2010. So, Dutch Mantel was hired as a TNA booker last week. Mantel worked as an agent at some of the early TNA shows. He left TNA and resumed focusing all of his attention toward booking the IWA promotion in Puerto Rico. Mantel is heralded as the booking mind that took the IWA promotion from years of losing money to overtaking Carlos Colon's World Wrestling Council as the island's top promotion. Mantel's departure from IWA took the promotion by surprise, although he has agreed to continue working there as a part-time consultant. Basically, he was offered twice as much money, so he left. Yeah. So, TNA sources say Dutch Mantel will have more power than fellow writers Vince Russo and Glenn Gilberti, although he will still answer to Jeff Jarrett. Russo and Gilberti were said to be surprised by the move, but the belief is that they will continue to work for the promotion in some capacity. I'm sure they were very pleased, as always. <laughs> they love more people coming in with power, but... <laughs> Because it definitely doesn't dil- uh, dilute their power. Mm, not at all. We, we know. There's one thing we know, Liam, consistently in, in TNA history. It's that Vince Russo, he works very well with other people. Yeah. He definitely isn't a fan of sabotage. There were rumblings going around that part of this was inspired by the fact that Russo was unwilling to sign a new contract. But that's unverified. Though. That was just scuttlebutt. That's the sheets. Mm. So... The natural assumption of the wrestlers is that the move was made because Hogan is negotiating with TNA and TNA officials know that Hogan will not want to work with Russo because of the incident between Russo and Hogan that caused Hogan to quit WCW and sue Time Warner over comments Russo said on live pay-per-view. However, Mantel being brought in certainly isn't only because of the hopes of lowering Hogan. Sources say the deal with Mantel has been in the works for some time. Wrestlers recalled uh, seeing a Dutch at a TNA show several weeks ago. They say Mantel mostly kept to himself and took notes throughout the show. I would pay so much money for those notes <laughs> what do you think dutch thinks of uh, what it, july or august tna yeah i just want to see what he th- like his first thoughts of the promotion and like his immediate like this is what we need to change 
Well, this month didn't see much in the way of Dutch influence by all accounts. He still was just get, like getting his feet wet on the last show of the month where he would have been like on board. Much like how I give Scott to more credit for everything good, I'm now also going to equate the first terrific TNA month with Dutch Metal. Well, to be fair, he had absolutely nothing to do with it. I'm giving it to full credit to Dutch Mentel. And honestly, the first two shows of this month I thought were great, and I thought the last one sucked. I didn't think the last one sucked. That show was terrible. If anything, the show where Dutch was on board for was a stark decline in quality from the two that preceded it, so... I disagree with the last show. This, this, this is what has thrown me. We'll argue about that more. So Dutch has joined TNA Creative. Cool. WWE showed last minute interest in signing Johnny Swinger, Simon Diamond, and Trinity earlier this week. <gasps> WWE quickly found out that Trinity had signed a TNA contract several months ago, so those discussions broke down quickly. I like how <laughs> there were discussions. <laughs> and they're like, hey, Trinity, you want to come? And she's like, oh, well, maybe. <laughs> she's like, oh, you know, I do have this contract, though. And they were like, wait, contract? It's like, yeah, I signed it like four months ago. It's like, oh, bye. <laughs> they have those there? <laughs> The word in the TNA locker room is that the WWE official who contacted uh, Swinger and Diamond wanted them to put off signing their TNA contract so they could negotiate with WWE. Swinger and Diamond told TNA wrestlers that they later received a phone call from a WWE official who informed them that the company would not be making an offer because Vince McMahon doesn't like negotiating under deadlines. So basically they missed their window and didn't get to Simon Diamond and Johnny Swinger. That's unfortunate because Swinger and Diamond rule. <laughs> They would have really lit the 2003 WWE Tag Team Division on fire. They would have been working with the world's greatest tag team. That would have been a good match, The actually. Jim and I. The Jim and I. The Basham and Damager, were they around? They were probably developmental. To be fair, they're very 2003 WWE, aren't they? London and Kendrick? Yeah, I think Los Guerreros were still a team by 03. They would have oh, put them in SmackDown. Go on, this is a banging tag division. Mm. All indications are that just about every wrestler who was offered a contract signed. There were some wrestlers who asked to be guaranteed 30 to 45 dates per year. Management was reluctant to give those wrestlers that many guaranteed dates, but did compromise by giving those wrestlers 26 guaranteed dates. There were also some wrestlers who negotiated for creative control of their own characters outside of TNA. The big example that is cited here is perhaps CM Punk, who is working as Raven's protege in TNA and feuding with Raven in Ring of Honor. And also, you know, a legitimate... Like, top guy in ROH probably doesn't want to be uh, handcuffed by TNA's booking, which is something that they were trying to implement at the time. Yeah, I, I hope they were like, uh, you can't actually be booked as a top guy in Ring of Honor because you're actually only like a mid card guy here, so they have to book you as a mid card guy too. <laughs> yeah, can you turn it down, please, with the push? You're actually winning too much. We don't there. want people getting confused when they tune in to do or die. <laughs> They'll think you're really good, so you need to lose more often. I actually got to check to see if Punk was even on Do or Die. <laughs> I just picked a random ROH show that I could remember. May 2003. Uh, Second City Saints defeat the Briscoe Brothers, the Carnage Crew, and Special K. Classic tag team scramble. That was the show when Punk wrestled like twice. <laughs> what was his other match? Uh, Daniels, Punk, Kazarian, Jimmy Rave. He was in two different multi-man scrambles. Yep, and the main event of that show was Joe Homicide in a match that absolutely rocks. Yeah, we'll see that in 2009 TNA where it'll be infinitely better, I'd imagine. Yeah, well, I'm willing to give it a chance. We we saw um Iceberg on this show as well, Garrett. Oh, yeah, Edward Chastain. How's he doing for himself? <laughs> Unfortunately for him, he basically got booed out of the building. So basically the exact same thing that happened in his TNA run. Uh, yes. Was he not like, Don Callis managed me. Remember Don? This was May, so was this before? Yes. I mean, at the same time, basically. Because, because he was like July, he showed up with Don. I'm trying to think if there's anything else notable from TNA alum. <laughs> uh, Tony Mamaluke defeated Jason Cross. Did he have his theme song? I don't believe so. Did Jason Cross have his theme song? <laughs> no, but he did the flip. Good, that's all you need. Nothing else TNA adjacent here. <laughs> The Panda Energy Company really sees TNA as a long-term project worth investing in. The Panda rep, reps who work with the Jarrett's on a weekly basis have gotten really into the pro wrestling industry. They seem to be, enjoy learning about the industry and want to make the project work in the long run. They've really become big fans of wrestling, says one TNA wrestler. Yeah, they were um, trading uh, Old Japan women's tapes to me as a <laughs> child. <laughs> Dixie is like, hey, you got this match? Oh, hey... <laughs> <laughs> you got that Akira Hakuto <laughs> I didn't commit to the Dixie accent there because I didn't want to step on your gimmick yeah you know yeah, we, we all know 
The signing of the core group of wrestlers to one-year guaranteed contracts further demonstrates Panda's desire to see this project through at least one more year. Long term. Most, if not all, the contracts have an option for a second year, which allows management to either lock them in anyone for another year or cut them loose without any obligation after the first year. So yeah, it's nice that Panda are like, all right, th- this has a year. Yeah, we'll give you a year. We'll see how it goes after a year, but it has a year. Maybe two. We have a, we have we can renew everyone. So maybe two years. But for the core group that WWE like what might want to sign of Styles, Raven, Shane, Kazarian, Saban, Daniels, Saw Diamond, Mitchell, Harris, they're not available. I was gonna say, like, let's look at these names and say which ones are like yeses and which ones are noes for WWE to sign. For like which like which ones are smart TNA lockdown choices? All right, I think all of them. All right then, fuck my segment then, huh? Is there anybody here who you're like, nah, I wouldn't have signed? AJ. <laughs> Father James Mitchell. Yeah. Norman Smiley. It's all the guys who form like the backbone of the actual show. You get Styles, Raven, Shane, Kaz, Saban, Daniels, Diamond Swinger, Harris, Storm, Mitchell. Hey, listen, it doesn't say Swinger got one. That's true. Or it's just that WWE don't want him, maybe. <laughs> well, we, we know that they wanted him. They said earlier that they wanted him. <laughs> maybe they're like, oh, he locked down uh, Diamond, but we don't want Swinger by himself. Yeah, they wanted the tag team. <laughs> Norman Smiley is no longer with TNA because his pay was being cut nearly in half. Yeah, that's fair. So Shark Boy has been bounced around from multiple tag team partners. He gets a new one this month. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And TNA is now offering cable companies a 30-minute pregame countdown show on Wednesday nights starting this week, although not all cable companies are carrying it at first. BTI. Whoa, whoa. You gotta love some BTI. Before the internet. I'm trying to think what the I would stand for in 2003. <laughs> Before the influx of bad wrestling that you're about to watch. How dare you. An interesting note, they're also going to be available on, on In The Band's High Definition Pay-Per-View channel. Ooh. In 2003, so they those with high def TVs can take advantage of a better picture. All these shows, like the, the archive version of these shows aren't available in high definition. So I wonder where the hell those ever went. Damn. If only we knew someone who could find that out. Yeah, there's no way of knowing. <laughs> <laughs> So if only someone could inquire about where those high definition versions of these shows are. If they ever actually air. Maybe it was still 4x3. It's just a very nice looking 4x3. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, like, when they watch these shows on the 4K TV and not on, like, my computer or my phone, they do look way better. So maybe it's just me. Mm. All right. That brings us to broad topics for the week. Let's start with the Super X Cup. Cool. I want, this is great because um, it's my favorite thing in pro wrestling. Ever? Tournaments. You do love yourself a tournament. They're the best. I love a tournament. So, NWA TNA pay-per-view number 61, September 3rd, TNA held the inaugural Super X Cup, which, as we mentioned, was taped in the last two weeks of August, because this show, the the National Fairgrounds, wasn't available for the first two weeks of September, so they taped this show, and they did the one-cent pay-per-view on September 10th. This show, Liam, Super X Cup, your favorite show in TNA history? It's probably right. So, the tournament idea came from Scott DeMore, Jeremy Borsch, and Mike Tanay. Uh, This is from the Wrestling Observer, so the I is Dave Meltzer. I don't believe it was a group effort, but do know all had suggestions on how to do it. Damore was the agent in charge of the matches and was given free reign of it. He used it as a vehicle to prove that if you book good matches and just let them do regular finishes, people will enjoy it. As opposed to overbooking that the company has done a lot in the past. They went with the idea of all straight finishes with no run-ins, weapons, or cheating except for the Lin and Saban finish. Tanae was the one who pushed Kazarian to get the win over Shane so that he could lose in the semifinals and still come out as a title contender. Wow, I I am beginning to be shocked, right? Mm-hmm. That Scott Demore, yeah, and Mike Cheney getting the book for a show led to the best show in company history. You mean these people who aren't embarrassed by pro wrestling and want pro wrestling to be anything other than pro wrestling ended up producing the best wrestling show TNA has ever put on? That's pretty crazy. And I gotta say, like the reason this show w- went was like so good, obviously. Because it started off with such a hot opener. Yeah, for some reason, on the show that, like, they were so pressed for time. The show had, like, nine matches. And yet, nonetheless, they began the show with the, the hot X Division style opener of Mad Mikey versus Laz. I, I was like, this is a weird first round match when this came out. <laughs> I can only imagine that, like, because this is a taped show... Maybe they mistimed it? I'm, I'm guessing that this was like a dark match that they eventually did have it mistimed and they just needed to feel 
the time with something. Yeah, so maybe it was taped for Explosion initially. As mentioned, it was a dark match. And they're just like, let's just put it on the show because we need to fill in another three or four minutes. And like all the other dark matches that we have banked have people in the, the tournament. Mm, it was very strange. Because like the first round matches in the tournament are very short. They're all like four minute sprints. So... I don't know, maybe they did just mistime it. Because, like, this whole tournament basically takes, like, an hour, ten minutes. From, like, the the, the second Hoovy and Nassau get to the ring to the finish of the, the finals takes about an hour, ten. Which is the, the briskest tournament you'll ever see in your life. They just go bam, 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 match, match, match. Whoa, 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 whoa. You haven't seen the Queen of the Ring. The, who? The It's not called the Queen of the Ring. They gave it a stupid other name. Where, like, every match was, like, 40 seconds. <laughs> where the entire tournament was, like, 19 minutes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> That is the briskest tournament you'll have ever seen. That's right, but this was also a good tournament, so it does have that going for it. Wow. So yeah, this match, the show opened with Laz against uh, Mad Mikey for some reason. Mad Mikey won. Um, Laz is an NWA Wildside guy. He's been doing a bunch of explosion matches. I don't appreciate this poor man's Bruce. Well, to be fair, at least he's doing the gay panic thing as a baby face as opposed to a heel. <laughs> does that make it is better? Is he a baby face? He was, well, Mad Mikey's a heel, so he's definitely a baby face. I don't think Mad Mikey's a heel. Mad Mikey's absolutely a heel. I don't think he's a heel. The whole crowd loves Mad Mikey. But, like, Mad Mikey's, like, the, he's getting mad and upset, and the crowd popped when, like, Laz did all the gay stereotype stuff as opposed to Bruce. But they always pop when they do the gay stereotype stuff. No, they usually shout slurs at him like they did with Bruce. Yeah, but they do that after they go, ah! <laughs> Laz is the weirdest creator wrestler randomized option I've ever seen. He doesn't look real, does he? Yeah, that was it was, like, uncanny. It's just like, how are you a real person who wrestles? Yeah, it was pretty insane. I don't want to spend any more time on Mad Mikey versus Laz. I, I did actually, I did enjoy that Mad Mikey was upset that he had to wrestle a goof. I think that's a good bit. That he's like, look at this goof cartoon character. I have to wrestle him? Unlike Mad Mikey, the not goof cartoon. <laughs> the very serious professional wrestler. <laughs> is very upset at having to wrestle this goof Laz. Uh, I did also enjoy Mike Tanay on commentary. He was really selling the fact that Mad Mikey stole his shoe and started beating himself up with it. He's like, I have never seen that before in my <laughs> life. So we go backstage to a Dusty promo. I did quite enjoy Dusty being there to give the War Games credibility. Obviously, the creator of War Games, so he's putting over War Games. Same War Games a lot, even though it's not a War Games match. War Games. It's a Wednesday bloody Wednesday match, Liam. I like how they're like, ha, they can't sue us now. We got the show going, so let's just say War Games throughout the entire time. And just have Dusty say War Games like 700 times in his promo. War <laughs> Games. We had our first round match in the Super X Cup tournament. Juventud Guerrero faced Nasawa. Uh, Chief strategy officer from Gleet in action here. <laughs> is that what Nasawa's job title is in Gleet? That's what it was. I don't believe he has that job title anymore. Oh, because he got the strategy wrong. <laughs> yes. Well, and no, I think he was like, he was brought in. <laughs> no one cares about this. I believe he was um, brought in early in life, like, just to help set everything up. And then he went, like, he was still doing his Noah job at the time. Mm. Probably through the Abima connection. No, sorry, not the Abima connection, the um, Ledette connection. I think everybody cares about Nosawa's uh, office roles through, through wrestling history. <laughs> One of the most powerful men in Japanese professional wrestling. Pop it up here to lose to Hoovy in a Super X Cup opening round match. Takagi, Gato, Nosawa, <laughs> the three most powerful men in Japanese professional wrestling at the moment. It really is the time, like, it, it, if you were a, an indie scummer in Japan in the early 2000s, you're really blown up now. So Hoovy wins here, the match was like three minutes. Nosawa has psychopathic records on the back of his gear, based because he's ICP's Jungle Championship Wrestling Champion. Yeah, Nassau was a big juggalo guy. Um, ha- obviously has the, the hatchet man tattoo on the neck. Mm, and the crowd were actually chanting ICP at him. Yeah, um, he's, he was quite a popular like dude at the time. Um, was, I thought it was actually pretty cool to see Nassau at this point in his career because um, he's very different to now. Mm. And not even that like he wrestles at like a faster pace or anything. He just wrestles a completely different style because now um, Nassau is more of like a lucha brawler that will bust out some, some, some faster stuff. But like here he was very much like stalking and like big kicks it kind of works like Tajiri there's a real rad kick to the face in this match yeah he did he had some cool kicks yeah I like Nassau I've always been a Nassau fan yeah Hoobie goes over I was devastated about Hoobie going over (laughs) we had an interview backstage with James Mitchell because the structure of the show is basically match interview match interview match interview so very rapid fire literally perfect (laughs) Uh, yeah so James Mitchell wanted to sap Raven's will to live by shaving his head yeah 
before we go to our second first round match in the Super S Cup tournament, Liam, Teddy Hart makes his NWA TNA debut to face Johnny Storm. Ted Hart. Oh, Ted. Ted, Ted, Ted. Wearing some silver, like, hook shorts here. I thought this gear sucked. <laughs> so you hate hooks gear is what you're saying. This isn't hooks gear at all. Hooks gear is good and this was terrible. So you're saying you hate hooks gear is what you're saying. No. I believe that's exactly what you said. Those shorts were hook shorts, just silver. No, they, they were not. They had no designs. Hooks barely has any designs. It has a hook on the front and it has little things on the sides. <laughs> you don't know anything about hook. That's what I'm learning here. Garrett, you're a fake hook fan. Listen, I was one of the original hookers. People jumped on the hook bandwagon. This guy. I'm an OG hook fan as opposed to these other people who are like, I'm getting in on the meme. Fake hook fan. Mike Tanay likened Teddy Hart to pre-WWF own Hart. Yeah, sure. I mean, he does crazier indie shit, but like, definitely innovative. Because I, I kind of get where he's coming from there, because Owen pre-WF was a lot more of a flyer than, like, WWF Owen. He was more of, like, a technical wrestler in the WWF as opposed to doing, like, not wild flying like Teddy Hart would do here. But for its time, I guess, it was wild flying. Yeah, it's pretty wild stuff to go back and watch, even by today's standards. Teddy Hart... Ma- imagine if Teddy Hart wasn't a giant fuck-up on literally every human level. <laughs> yeah, he'd probably be, like... One of the best wrestlers of all time. Because <laughs> legitimately, you watch him on the show, he has this match, and then he has the match against Hoovy. And he looks like a superstar. From, like, how he looks, like, a physique, gear, how he works. Like, this is a guy who you're like, oh, this is a can't-miss star. This is a guy who's going to be somebody. He has the legacy of the heart name. He has everything you could possibly need to succeed in this business. He innovates. He has a, a brain that... It looks at wrestling it with a different, like, mindset completely. And it just turns out he's just a giant, massive fuck-up on uh, in every way that he could possibly be. It's a shame, too, because you feel like if he had of... If he had of come with, like, the mindset of a professional and a guy who really wanted to push it, like, he could have been so much more. Oh, he would have been AJ-level in this company. Yeah. And, like, he might, he would have been, like, like a, a legitimate innovator. Because like, he makes his Ring of Honor debut this month as well, and they're like super excited to see him based off this Super X Cup appearance. And like, this is a guy who is as good as the best of that generation. Like, he could have went in there with Joe and had a great match. He could have went in there with Danielson and had a great match. But he's just such a God, colossal thing. Brian franchise. Danielson beating the shit out of Teddy Hart. <laughs> mm. He just cannot help himself because he's just such a colossal failure of a human being that he ruined his entire career and ruined probably the lives of others. Uh, a legitimate, like, wild, wild man. Mm. The match was fine. I liked the match. I thought they did some wild shit. Yeah, it was alright. I'm not, I'm not super into Storm. Oh, you don't like the Wonder Kid? Mm, he's fine. He just has never been, like... A blowout guy to me. He's kind of like a little bit all over the place. Not in the fun way of like a Teddy Hart. Have you seen like the Johnny Storm, Jody Fleisch matches from this era? Um, no. I like Jody Fleisch. Or the Johnny Storm, AJ Styles matches from this era. No. Really, really good stuff. The original like Brit Rez indie guys, Johnny Storm and Jody Fleisch. Well, maybe not the original. But the, the, the first guys that really broke out. I've seen the Fleisch stuff. I haven't seen the, the Storm stuff. You gotta, you gotta watch your Johnny Storm tapes. Maybe I will. Maybe I will, and Johnny Storm will prove me wrong. Uh, the finish of this match was a top rope DDT, which looked sick. Yeah, there was a lot of big finishes in these tournament matches. Yeah, they went for it. Which, hey, fuck it, why not? Because the way he did it, he, like, he, he jumped off the top and like went for, like full pendulum into a DDT. It looked so cool. Killed him. Yeah. Douglas, Diamond, and Swinger, and Siaki are all arguing backstage. They got on the same page before we had Saban defeating Jerry Lynn in the third first round match. Uh, this one was fine. Yeah, the, the the last two matches in these first rounds, it's like, oh, the TNA guys, ugh. <laughs> yeah, like, well, to be fair, there are also matches that we've seen. And again, all these matches are four minutes long. All the first matches are like, boom, 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 in and out, very quick. And like, you know, a four-minute Saban Lynn match isn't going to have the craziness of a four-minute Teddy Hart Storm match. Yeah, so the finish here, Lynn hit, I, can't, I think it was a TKO, and Saban got his foot in the ropes, and Jerry Lynn started losing his shit at the referee for... I, I don't know why. I, I don't get this Jerry Lynn character. John Callis has a point. I, like they, They've they just conveniently made this Jerry Lynn character a person who he has never been for the sake of this Don Callis story, though. To be fair, in TNA specifically, he has been a kind of a psychopath that like has a hair trigger. Mm. 
the whole AJ feud, he's had like the three like miniature X Division heel turns. Like this dude kind of does have a hair trigger. So maybe Don's right. Don does have a point. He's like, this dude's just unstable. He, and the, honestly, they might not be wrong. Mm. So Don Carlos came out to reprimand him after he was threatening a ref, which allowed Saban to grab the win. Hail Saban. Hail Saban, indeed. And then the last first round match, Frankie Kazarian against Michael Shane. Yeah, I don't really have anything to say about this. It was a match that happened. Mm-hmm. And it's a Kaz one to go through. I, I do like the booking of like the, ch- the champion losing in the first round to set up a challenger for him, so that even if Kaz loses to Saban in the next round, Kaz still has like the claim to have beaten Shane in the tournament. And the negative out of that is like kind of makes X Division champ look bad. Like he can't. Your champion of this division can't win the division's tournament. <laughs> Especially because he's beaten in four minutes. But uh, yeah, like if this match had gone like ten. While the others all went four, mm. that would have put over like the champion was hardest to beat of all, and it would have made um, Kaz look better in a loss in the next round. Styles and Russo were given out backstage that there, there's an agenda against Styles because he's wrestling a ton. I kind of like these Styles Russo promos because they're just like <laughs> they're just like so aghast at the way that <laughs> this has been booked. They they just hate Eric Watts. I, I'm surprised you like them. They're very anti Eric this... Watts. Well, they're characters. They're not real. Gary. If they were real, of course I wouldn't like. <laughs> Let's talk about your favorite match of all time. Yeah, the first semi-final match. Juventud Guerrero against Teddy Hart in, up until this point, the dumbest match in TNA history. <laughs> yes. This match is so dumb. It's two guys going out there doing, like, brainless jock wrestling. Just being like, who gives a shit about psychology? Who gives a shit about anything other than we're doing cool moves? And it ruled. They did a bunch of real cool moves. They did go out there and do a bunch of real cool moves. Teddy Hart, by the way, great gear. Yeah, uh, the best gear in this company's history. These cool, uh, like, gold tights. He was still wearing the same silver album pads that he had earlier as well. So, what made these tights so cool was not only were they gold and black, but if you look closely, they had, like, a black pattern, and in that pattern were little roses. Mm. So, it was roses and black, pa- and black, and then they had a silver outline on the thing, and then it was gold. Like, this was... Some fantastic gear here. And Hoobie had really great gear too. Yeah, Hoobie with his like white pleather tights. Yeah, with the, the silver outline on the, on the purple studded uh, uh, highlights. It's really cool. I will shout out Teddy Hart. He's the only person who wore multiple kinds of gear in his matches. That is my favorite like tournament trope. Where people have different gear for each match. I think you should do it. Like I think it's more impressive. I mean, honestly, it's cool here because like it's weird. <laughs> but um, I much prefer like if you're wrestling, if it's like a three night tournament, like a bowler. If you're wrestling in a bowl, you should have different gear every night. Mm. I also quite enjoyed that Hoovy is still doing rock tribute spots. <laughs> yeah, it's the juice, baby. He's still doing the people's elbow. He's still doing the rock bottom. I'm very much on board with this. This is the most relevant it's ever been. So yeah, uh, Teddy uh, stuck him with a spiral tap in this match. Like, he just flattened Hoovy with this spiral tap. <laughs> it was pretty brutal. Uh, my favorite part of this match was uh, Teddy Hart did a dive and he tweaked his knee and that was the story of the match. And we'll get into a note about that after the match as well. <laughs> but he tweaked his knee and, you know, he couldn't do his move and he, he went up to do the shooting star. He hit the shooting star, which is how he won his first match. And then he couldn't make the cover, Liam. He was like, oh, my knee hurts. Oh, He was so fine with it before then. Like leaping up there, flipping off to do the move. <laughs> But my favorite part is, like, literally 10 seconds later, he does a nip up. <laughs> yeah. He's too hurt to get up on this shooting star. But 10 seconds later, he's like, ah, oh, I'm fine. Not his only problematic nip up. <laughs> Finished top rope hooey driver as well. Insanity. One of the coolest things that this show has ever done. Like, move-wise. Just dropped Teddy Hart right in his head off the top. Up there with the second rope stars clash. God, this match ruled. This match is, like, I give this match four stars. It's so stupid. It's like two guys just doing the most brainless shit. This is a, it's a big night for Hoovy. Yeah, it is a very big night for Hoovy. I think it's a big, like, comeback night for Hoovy. A guy, like, in the WCW days, people were like, Hoovy and Ray are the two guys, you know? They're, they're the two top luchadors who clearly are, like, have the highest ceiling, especially given how young they were at the time. And then it worked out very well for Ray, and it never quite worked out for Hoovy. And I think people are like, well, you know, he lets his demons, he lets his, his personal issues get in front of him. And this was like a, a big comeback night for him where he went out there and killed it. Hmm. So Hoobie advances to the finals of the Super X Cup. You're talking about what happened after the match? <laughs> oh, yes. Literally right after the three count. This is from the Wrestling Observer. Teddy Hart did a nip up and basically walked around the ring looking for tears, selling uh, instead of selling a pretty hardcore finish. 
None of this will air on television, as they will show Guerrero outside the ring and celebrating. But people were amazed at Hart's lack of sense. Well, you see, I can see... I can understand Teddy Hart, I think. Because in his mind, the show ended as soon as that three count happened. Mm. Like... He, the curtain went down, and this was his. This was him coming out to get his bow, <laughs> which he of course deserved. When when your character doesn't, when your character dies in a, in a production, at the end you still get to come out and bow. And like his in his I, in his mind, he saw this and he's like, yeah, okay, my part of the show is over now. But like he was trained by the hearts. Oh, obviously, not as brutally as other people were. Like he knows that's not how wrestling works. Like there was once. A, an episode of Raw that ended with Chris Jericho being knocked out by a knockout punch. And Jericho lied in the <laughs> ring until everybody left. Well, to be fair, that's a bit. <laughs> he did. He sold the move until everybody had left the building. Like, that's, that's how pro wrestlers funniest. work. They're ridiculous human beings who, like, commit to their bits to an extreme degree. They, they do not break kayfabe. So, like... He he was raised by the kind of people who should have taught him things like that. Just born different. He was. Teddy Hart, born different. In many different ways. So your other semi-final match, we had an interrogator segment with the red shirts. They they like Don Callis. They're very mad about things. Same. <laughs> and our, our second semi-final, Frankie Kazarian against Chris Saban, where Saban won to advance to the finals. And maybe their best match, because they just went out there and went straight to doing shit. Yeah, this was just, they just did spots and it was cool. Because, like, like, maybe they should just work a million miles an hour every time. Man, the exhibition story. Instead of trying to work holds or, or do something else or, or, or build, it's just go out there and do shit. That's what people want out of you. Hmm. The same one with a muscle buster that he calls the Back to the Future. Everyone's got a move called Back to the Future. <laughs> well, particularly Chris Saban and Frankie Kazarian have moves called and Back Kushida. to the Future. A lot of people love freaking Back to the Future. It's a good movie, but I don't know why people love it that much. I have definitely seen it. Have you not seen Back to the Future? I have seen Back to the Future. Have you actually? Yeah, I've seen it. Or are you saying that so I won't shout at you? No, I've seen it. Have you seen Back to the Future 2? No. Ah. Ted Hart versus Hooventude got a four and a quarter from Dave. Damn right. That's the most Dave-ass match that's ever existed. <laughs> like, for all the things people say about Dave, like... He cares about, like, technical execution of things more than anything. More than, like, psychology. But he also loves some dumb shit. <laughs> yeah, like, he doesn't care about psychology. He doesn't care about, like, emotion. Like, just people doing things technically well is the thing that, like, pops him more than anything. Which is, I think, the reason he loves modern wrestling more than anything. And, like, that Teddy against Hoovy match is, like, the definition of it. I think he also just loves innovation. Or really respects innovation. I don't think he's going to be the guy who's like, oh, he really didn't sell the knee properly there. Yeah. Or he'll mention it, but like, it won't be a game breaker for him. Like, yeah, that's not who Dave is. That's not who he has ever been as a critic. Because if you read like Dave's reviews of matches, he never reviews matches. He does walls of text mm. of what happened and then slaps a star in it. Dave will never tell you why he liked a match. He, yeah, he, he, he breaks it down to like the move by move. It's because that's how he thinks about wrestling. It's not emotion for him. Which is wild, because that's what the entire goddamn sport is. But that's that's what he likes. He just breaks down move by move, rating. Mm. Which is fascinating that that then made him the preeminent critic in the, the entire genre. <laughs> but, <laughs> alas, here we are. We go backstage. Oh no, did we had the final first? We had the final first. So yeah, poor um, Chris Saban went out there, had the match against Kazarian, and then went straight back out to have the main event against Hoovy. Nah, he probably had this on another taping. <laughs> That's true. He, I think they did. But still. <laughs> Super X Cup Final. Juventud Guerrera versus Chris Saban. And for me, maybe the best match in TNA history so far. I like the cage match more. Mm, they're, they're both up there as like one and two for me. And then the, the first X title match, I think, is, is the other one that I think. I think this blows the first X title match away. You're a hater of Jerry Lynn, though. That's well known. Nah, true. So, the, well, you gave this three and the three quarters first, so don't you tell me no, about what no, blows things no, away. I didn't. No, I didn't. Don't you come out don't. here and tell me about uh, what matches are good or bad when you gave this three and three quarters? I gave this four and a quarter. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, you do. Don't you think I don't see your revised star ratings? Or, well, you, I didn't. You told me about it. But. <laughs> no, I, I've learned to never tell you anything. <laughs> That's true. You shouldn't. I'll expose you. This was great. This felt like a best of the Super Juniors finals. I, I love the way they worked this match in that 
it was the most, I think, counter-focused match I've ever seen. Or, like, the crux of this match is that these two dudes keep on countering each other. They, keep, like, relentlessly counter each other. They go for power bombs, they slip out. They go for ranas, they slip out. They go for cradle shocks, they slip out. They go for hoovy drivers, they slip out. And they do those sequences at a million miles an hour. Like, they're just going and this match is 15 minutes it's not like, like the other ones where it's like you know it's ted hart and hoovy out there for eight minutes where they're just doing wild shit for eight minutes it still had escalation to it too which is super impressive yeah like the the, the amount these two countered each other like just blew my mind and the speed at which they did it like every single sequence where they're like slipping in and out of moves and countering each other and constantly moving into something else like god these two are such like chris saban is i think 21 here I know it's so upsetting how good he is I think this is really interesting too because they managed to get the feel and the emotion of a 25 minute epic and like condense it to 15 minutes which I think is what everybody should strive to do probably Um, Dave gave this four and a half damn right right in line with me good job Dave you are correct yeah, this is fantastic. This is one of those matches that you like. Listen to our recommendations. Uh, go see this one. There's also like just just the head droppiest of head drops in this match. <laughs> There's a couple of them. Or Hoobie does a tiger driver and drops Chris Sabin right on his head. Like there's there there's no like oh it's on his neck. He's like it's literally picks him up top of his head. I don't know how he didn't die. <laughs> yeah, um, Hoobie's a killer. <laughs> Also, uh, he does the Hoobie driver in the corner and then goes up and hits the 450. And one, it's it's foreshadowed by Saban getting a rope break in the first match. So it's like a little bit of a, a through, story t- uh, through uh, tournament storytelling. But he gets his foot in the rope in like uh, one of the best rope break segments. I bite, I've seen this match like six or seven times. I bite on that near fall every single goddamn time. <laughs> It's good. It's fantastic wrestling. Two phenomenal pro wrestlers. Two people who are just tremendous at their craft. And like Hoovy's, I think Mike Tanay's at twenty eight here, so he's like he's not a particularly young man anymore, but he's still a guy who has like just years ahead of him if he was really like on top of things. Which unfortunately he's not for a variety of reasons because he's Hoovy. But we got this moment here. He's the juice, baby. That's the juice. Comes with the territory of being the juice. But at least we did get this moment here where he shows up in TNA and just has maybe one of the best matches in company history. Hmm. So Chris Saban is your Super X Cup champion. He wins with the, not the Cradle Shock, the other one, the like flippy aroundy one. The Amityville deal? I think it's that's the Future Shock, right? God, so many names. <laughs> we, we missed that in a backstage segment where Terry Taylor was talking to Kid Cash. Abyss, supremely wet. The wettest man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what we don't. He walks through a waterfall every time he goes out to do a segment. I literally, how he has to stand under the shower, right? That's the only way you could be that wet. Uh, he probably just dumps a bottle of water all over himself. No, because the, the the pattern of the water is like constant. He is drenched. There's not like you know. There's not like bits that the water. Maybe it's is multiple made. water bottles. Maybe Kid Cash grabs two and he grabs two. He got grabs like literally a bucket. He has, grabs like the Nickelodeon slime tank and dumps it over him, but it's water. Yeah. he's so wet I can't get over how wet he is and because he wears that like blue vest you can see how wet he is because like th- th- there's different colours of it it's like the wet colour and the slightly dry colour at the end and it doesn't go away it doesn't the man loves being wet he enjoys the wet- <laughs> the wettest he would be wet stay bloody wet stay yeah so that's our Super X Cup but the main event of the Super X Cup show was the first war games in TNA history the Wednesday bloody Wednesday cage match in which D. LeBron, Jeff Jarrett, Raven and AMW faced the phenomenal AJ Styles Christopher Daniels, Shane Douglas, Simon Diamond and Johnny Swinger I have nothing to say about this I thought it was well worked at times and boringly worked at others because the, the reason these matches fail is when guys come out and they do nothing. So you have the 90 second interval, if people, somebody comes out and nothing happens. They don't set up a sequence of spots, they don't set up a sequence of like things that are memorable. They, just another person comes out and they do some brawling until somebody else comes out. But there are periods where like people came out and stuff happened and I did quite enjoy that. I have nothing to say about this match. There was, like, a lot going on in this match. Like, not in the match. Like, around the match. I have nothing to say about this match. Because you had, like, Dusty as the Keeper of the Key. You had Watts at ringside. You had Don Callis at ringside. You had Russo at ringside. Callis is on commentary. Then, for some reason, like, Eric Watts is... 
like, oh, this match is so violent that we can't have ring attendants or ring announcers. So we're bringing out three live crew to serve the role of ring attendant and ring announcer and uh, other such roles. I have nothing to say about this match. Harris absolutely killed AJ with a spear. Chris Harris's spear. I'm saying it every single episode. Everyone's like, oh, Roman Reigns spear and the Goldberg spear. It's like they got nothing on Chris Harris's spear. They got nothing on Jerry Lynn's spear. Damn right. The, the spear kings in the NWA TNA. Not, none of these WWE nerds. I have nothing to say about this match. Uh, and the last thing I will say about this match before you have nothing to say about this match. Chris Harris had a spinning catatonic on AJ. Where, you know, usually he just does a regular catatonic, but he did like two rotations, he did like two spins, and then catatonic them. It looked so cool. I have nothing to say about this match. Uh, so Jarrett and D'Lo D- D- and Harris even went up top. D'Lo hit a frog splash, Harris hit a leg drop, and then Jared pinned, I think it was Styles to score the win. After the match, there was a big brawl, after which Douglas cut a little bit of Raven's hair to foreshadow the hair versus hair match coming up on the September 17th pay-per-view. You know, I have one thing to say about this match. Oh, so suddenly, he's shown up. <laughs> I didn't hate it. Like, I thought it was fine. It's just, I didn't. Like, there's nothing great about it. Yeah, I thought it was a nice, fine, good little match that didn't live up to, like, the idea of war games. And, like, as I said, there's periods where, like, you know, Chris Harris comes out and he does do a, just a sick-ass spear. Spears ages out of his boots. And then there's times where, like, I don't know, Shane Douglas come out and they just do some punches. <laughs> and nothing would happen. Like, you, you've got to construct these matches so that each 90-second sequence is a 90-second sequence. You can't just be lazy and be like, this dude comes out, he hits guys with a couple of weapons, and then we stall for the other 75 seconds until somebody else comes out. <laughs> you do need to construct it as, a like, a series of mini 90-second matches where interesting things happen and they have their own little self-contained stories. Otherwise, the match is just generic brawling and guys hitting each other with weapons, which might have been innovative in the 90s but these days it's just like we've seen this a million times before you have to do something new and fresh with it i don't know exactly that. <laughs> so that is wednesday bloody wednesday the first war games match in the history of tna wrestling i ordered a pizza during that <laughs> was it a good pizza what you get in the pizza uh i just got a margarita i just wanted i wanted a, i wanted something simple it's not my go-to where'd you order it from uh, a place called don antonio is it your local Where's the freaking Gabagool? It's my local... Um, it's the best pizza that's open the latest. Uh, that's what I have to resort to. Four-star pizza from like 30 minutes away that comes uh, and it's cold. It's always great fun. <laughs> because I got some... I, oh, this is one place near me. When I tell you it's the absolute last resort, it is the absolute... It, it is... I have gotten home after being out all night and it's 6 a.m. And I need something to eat. A Thor pizza, it's called. Thor. <laughs> Truly. Some of the most abysmal food I've ever eaten in my life, and I've ordered it twice. Oh, no. I think I got sick from it. You know how hard it is to get sick from pizza? Yeah, you'd have to pretty badly undercook the dough. Ugh. I guess you can undercook the meats as well. I was going to say, and also it's chicken, so who knows? Mm, that, could, that could take you anywhere. Or it's probably not even chicken. Who knows what it is? <laughs> yeah. Hammer of the gods, baby. Mm. You've Got to Be Kidding Me is brought to you this week by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. The new year is a great time to focus on what's most important to you. Whether it's saving money by ordering less takeout, learning to cook, or prioritizing your wellness... HelloFresh is here to help with endless options to make cooking at home simple and enjoyable. HelloFresh cuts back on time spent in the kitchen so you can spend it on your other resolutions with meals ready in around 30 minutes or less. Plus quick and easy meals including 20 minute recipes and low prep and easy cleanup options provide an even faster route to putting food on the table. I know as I hit the new year I'm one of those who makes many resolutions, many of which are hard to stick to, but HelloFresh makes eating healthy easy, affordable and fast. Go to HelloFresh.com slash VOW16 and use the code VOW16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com using the code VOW16. So September 10th we had the one cent paper which we already ran down. We'll we'll go to the other broad stories of the month. There's not a ton of them. Let's start with Raven and the franchise which had their big it wasn't quite the blow off because they're still feuding but the 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 culmination of their feud so far on the september 17th nw18 number 62 in which they finally had liam a hair versus hair match 
This was a pretty, like, okay. This match took a bit to get going. Mm-hmm. But by the end of it, I was like, yeah, this rocked. So, yeah, it's it's a very much a Raven and Shane Douglas match. Where it's, like, two guys kind of doing plodding, brawling around ringside. Like, Shane Douglas is never going to blow your mind with a series of sequences you've never seen before. But what Shane Douglas can do is he can bring a crowd into a match and get them invested in it. So, like, even if he's still just doing basic plodding, brawling, at least the crowd are into it. Yeah. And obviously, I think Raven's having a tremendous run as a babyface. I think he's, like, maybe at the peak of his career as a worker at this stage. Ever since he made that change, he's been killing. Mm. He's just, like, legitimately good. Yeah, I've really enjoyed um, that switch. And, like, I think even just before, because I really enjoyed the Jarrett match as well, but he's been, like, firing in all cylinders. We must mention, Liam. <laughs> uh, okay, before we mention the incident, uh-huh. I, I, I want to give... Shane Douglas, some credit here. Okay. Because my man, he rolled with the punches. He really did. And he honestly, post the incident, it might have been the best work of the match. <laughs> so, fair play to the dude for keeping going and then, like, tearing it up another level. So, this match is, like, 15 minutes long. Like, like halfway through, Shane Douglas is leaning against the ropes and he throws up. <laughs> he Just a little bit of vomit leaves his mouth. And then he moves over to Raven and a little bit more vomit leaves his mouth. And then him and Raven do a little sequence that ends him with him being, like, kicked by Raven. And he turns around, and a large amount of vomit leaves his mouth. And, like, a dark viscous. It's a weird, like, texture to it, isn't it? Yeah, it's rough. Because it's it's not, like, chunks or anything. It's literally straight liquid coming out of his mouth. Yeah. (laughs) This gross yellow liquid, just like... It's the fact that he throws up in three stages as well. Like, there's the little bit of vomit, the second little bit of vomit, and then the third lot of vomit. It's just like, there's a, an escalating series of vomit from Shane Douglas here. Yeah. Um, we should mention, too, that this was the, the show that we did the live reaction to. So, if you want to see the live reaction to this. And yeah, I set it up for Liam where it's like, I was like, this is a big Shane Douglas match. And Liam was like, why? And it's like, oh, you'll see. <laughs> And I was like, oh, maybe he delivers performance of a lifetime. <laughs> no, he just gawks in the middle of the ring. <laughs> I will say, credit to Mike Tanay, the pro is the pros, who's like, that's how physical this match is. That's how, like, intense this rivalry is. They don't know Stella, they don't pretend the man didn't just vomit in the middle of the ring. They they presented the vomit as, like, this is the true escalation the of this rivalry. Beat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't blame him. Like, <laughs> shit's probably crazy at the moment. But, I, again, like, hey, he brought the match back after this, so I can't be too mad at the guy. To be fair, if we don't know that it wasn't worked vomit. Yeah, it might have been worked vomit. It didn't look like real vomit. It might have been might have been worked vomit. <laughs> or it might have been real vomit, but he can just be one of those people who can trigger himself to throw up at any time. So he's like, let's work it yeah. into the angle, he's baby. Got a, he's got a puke. We don't have worked vomit. We have, obviously, blood is the big thing in wrestling. But, like, someone throwing up is, is like, it is a visceral indication of how intense a match is. Yeah. Someone should take that. Someone should... Okada, next domain event, 56 minutes in, should throw up. <laughs> wrist control. He grabs the wrist. He turns the other direction. It's like... <laughs> he does the he put, does the rainmaker, pulls him out. As he comes in, he just throws up on him. <laughs> or, instead of doing, like, mist... Somebody should do vomit in the face. Ugh, that's just disgusting. <laughs> Remember when, like, they did the hour draw with Omega and Okada, mm-hmm. and Omega dodged the Rainmaker by, like, just falling and collapsing to, due to exhaustion? Yeah. How much more impactful would that have been if Omega just threw up? <laughs> and threw up in three different stages, like Franchise did. <laughs> Dodging every Rainmaker by throwing up. <laughs> you see, he throws up in front of Okada, and Okada slips in the vomit and then misses the Rainmaker. <laughs> no, he throws up in front of Okada, then Okada gets sick and throws up. <laughs> And it's just an escalating series of vomit. Oh, what if Raven was a guy who throws up when he sees throw up? <laughs> uh, Alright, let's get off the throwing up. <laughs> yeah. So, finish, they go up top, Raven hits a gnarly looking Raven effect off the top rope through a table. Yeah. And Shane Douglas t- what a finish, huh? takes, takes a nasty bump. Well, it's, it's not the finish because <laughs> Raven goes for the cover. One, two, technically franchise kicks out, but lights go out. I, I did quite enjoy mentioning the watch. I, I like that franchise kicked out because, like, why didn't the referee just count three just that the lights are off? I guess he doesn't see the shoulders anymore. It's good refereeing, I suppose. But 
Good refereeing either way. Yeah, so the franchise kicks out so that the referee doesn't lose some integrity, doesn't lose some credibility. Uh, the mystery man, who we've seen for weeks at this stage, maybe even months, I think he goes all the way back to July, who's been a- attacking Raven, is finally revealed to be Vampiro! Yeah. Vampiro hits Raven with the DDT, franchise pins him, and then Raven gets his head shaved. He sure fucking does. Yeah. This is, like, genuinely uncomfortable. It really is. So they sit Raven in the chair, and Mike Tanay and Don West go into overdrive, where, like, they are absolutely furious. They are absolutely outraged that this is how Raven's going to lose his hair. And Don's like, oh, I wouldn't even blame him if he doesn't go through with it. Then Mike Tanay is like, no, he's a man of honor. Even though he, he's he's been done wrong, he's still going to sit there and have his head shaved. So James Mitchell picks up the clippers, Liam. He picks them up upside down. <laughs> <laughs> and shaves Raven's head and literally scalps the man. He, like, literally takes chunks out of his head as he's shaving Raven's head. You can see the blood trickling off his skull. It's even worse. They show a video package and a promo the next week where you can see the scars on his head from, what, like, all the blood and all the cuts that, like, this head shave gave him. And, like, to be fair, it made the head shave, like, a hundred times more intense. Oh, this angle was so much more impactful now. <laughs> it's such a better angle because he was legitimately scalped in the middle of the ring here live in an NWA TNA pay-per-view. But God, it must have sucked. And you can see Raven's face. Oh, he, he wanted to not take this so badly in the moment. Like, you could see him wincing. You can see him being like, fuck, why does this hurt so much? Yeah, um... <sighs> There's a couple things about it because it's like, first of all, obviously, sucks a Raven, but like... Like, fair play to him for just gritting his teeth and taking it. And you can see him. He's literally gritting his teeth as well. He's like, Arr! And I'm, you know, I'm not glad it happened, but fuck, like, it, t- it turns this angle, like, a whole up another level, doesn't it? it? It turns it from, like, a regular hair angle to something, like, that feels legitimately different and special. And it's already, like, the best shoot in the company, too. Mm. So, like, it really just puts it to that next level. I really hope that, um, the payoff matches are worth it. <laughs> Well, we do get a Raven Vampiro match, so you can look forward to that. I hope it's worth it. <laughs> you can see the build. I think actually all the Vampiro's matches take place in October. I think the whole thing happens in October, and then Vampiro's never seen again. So that makes sense. It's the most spookiest month of the year. It is. You have to do the spooky Raven Vampiro month all through the month of October. Uh, yeah. Uh, this match is crazy. Yeah. You get the vomit. You get the top rope DDT. You get the actual legitimate scalping of Raven. You get Vampiro. Vampiro's there too, I guess. Yeah, um, I, I haven't, honestly, I haven't seen enough Vampiro to get super excited for this, but his Pentagon match was, like, almost legitimately, like, a perfect match, so. Mm. Yeah, Vampiro, he's a good worker in his day. I liked Vampiro in WCW, even if a lot of what he did in WCW wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'm excited to give this a shot. So we have a, a few backstage notes. Let's start with who the mystery reveal was originally meant to be, Liam. You suggested at one stage you'd like to see yes. it be Ricky Vanderas, better known as Judas Macias. That was, in fact, the original choice. Ah. From the Wrestling Observer, the original choice for the mystery guy was Ricky Vanderas, but it, that was nixed uh, a ways back because the, of the idea nobody would know him if he was unmasked, which is probably a good idea. It's true. Uh, another point, CM Punk was considered, which I think would be a pretty good twist, a good turn, and that's the reason like he's a mystery Yeah, man. but the guy was like clearly a big dude. <laughs> CM Punk was just wearing some platform shoes. Ah, uh, fair enough. And then the other one was Terry Funk, but Funk turned him down. Funk would have ruled. Funk would have ruled so hard. So Vampiro was like the fourth choice. Hey man, if not four, not four bad names. And uh, yeah, uh, in terms of like who fits best with the new church, like Vampiro is probably the best option. I don't know. I like Terry Funk with the new church. <laughs> Funk, demonic funk. Uh, he doesn't even need to be demonic. He's just a bad motherfucker. <laughs> like, imagine James Mitchell and Terry Funk promos on Raven. Mm. So there was a backstage issue between Raven and Jim Mitchell after the September 17th show, uh, based on how rough before James Mitchell has <laughs> got his hair. Yeah. Before the show, Jeff Jarrett gave Raven and Mitchell instructions in front of several wrestlers in the locker room. One wrestler overheard Mitchell ask Jarrett if there was a certain way he should hold the clippers when he uh, he cut Raven's hair. Jarrett told him to simply press down until the hair started coming off. However, Mitchell held the clippers the wrong way and left Raven's scalp a bloody mess. When Raven got backstage, Mitchell approached him to apologize. Raven took a swing at Mitchell, although observers say it looked as if Raven thought better of punching Mitchell and actually pulled the punch. Raven yelled at Mitchell, but they made up the next day. I'm glad. Uh, probably because Raven's like, oh yeah, fuck yeah, it's actually a great angle, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, I wonder how far away from the the incident happening was Raven and Mitchell like, okay, that, that ruled though, right? Yeah. 
Because I get like the immediate visceral come backstage, your head is bleeding like shit and you just have to sit there in a great deal of pain. You probably like emotionally charged. But if you like watch it back the next day, you're like, fuck, that was a great angle. And Raven like three days later is for sure being like, yeah, that was the plan. (laughs) (laughs) And like you can see them being sat down and Raven sat down and they show him in the mirror and you can see like behind him with like Douglas and everybody cackling with glee at how they've shaved Raven's head and Raven's looking at his his changed visage and god it, it's 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 good that's pro, that's pro wrestling liam that's pro wrestling i guess the perfect mix of like real emotion real violence and camp mm. which is like perfect pro wrestling and also like shout out to raven my man looks handsome with a shaved head he does he looks well so he, he really won out in the long run with all this he got the big payoff for shaving his head too so mm. yeah my man uh did great NWA TNA Favorite number 63, the feud continued. We had a backstage interview. Uh, actually, you know, we, sh- we had a show opening promo from Raven where he was like, sometimes you lose matches and you you, you know you feel bad. It, it affects your emotional psyche. But there's not actual physical loss. Whereas here, there is physical loss. And every time I look at my reflection, every time I look in the mirror and see myself, I feel shame. And, you know, it, 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 he did a good job of trying to sell the fact that this is actually a, a, an emotional thing for him. Yeah, that's why I think hair versus hair matches always do well. It's because, like, there's, like, real, res- actual... Something comes from this. Like, it's not just a, a feud that we th- forget about six months later. It's, like, real consequences. The person looks different for months on television until their hair grows back. Yeah. As you said, he looks pretty good with his head shaved, except for the fact that if you look closely, you can actually see the scars of the scalping. It looks so- to be fair, I think that actually makes it look sicker. <laughs> it looks so gross. He looks cool as shit. And then the main event of this show, I think we had a Mitchell promo on the show at one stage as well where he gloated about it. But the main event of the show was uh, the gathering against uh, Shane Douglas and the New Church in a dog collar match. Yeah, I, f- I felt like, why are we doing this a little bit, you know? Well, it was to get to the vampiro angle, but... I don't know, I feel like you could have just done, like, New Church without Raven and Douglas, you know? Mm. So, yeah, the, the Ra- I don't know how this match ended. I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I don't, um, Julio won, like, randomly. <laughs> because Raven and Douglas were brawling on the floor, you hear a bump, you hear a one, two, three counted, you hear the audible count, you hear the bell ring, and then they cut back to the ring, and they're like, oh, the match is over. <laughs> I remember, I, I, I missed this, and I thought it was just me missing it, but then I didn't care enough to go back. <laughs> well, it wasn't just you. Like, sometimes people miss finishes, and it's like, oh, they cut the angle wrong, or whatever. Like, they missed this finish by, like, a country mile. I don't think a finish has ever been more missed on a pro wrestling television show. Which, to be fair, I don't blame them that it's, like, Julio De Niro and Slash or whatever is in the ring. I, the, the director is probably like, that finish isn't coming. It's Julio De Niro and Slash in the ring. But also, like, it, does, it also kind of, like, puts the emphasis on, like, how much, like, the Raven Douglas stuff matters, you know what I mean? But also kind of buries Julio at the same time. Oh, no, not Julio. You gotta protect Julio. So, uh, as mentioned, this was a dog collar match. So, obviously, the, uh, it was a six-man tag dog collar match. It was a very weird setup. So, each man was tied to another. Where I think it was Punk and Slash, Raven and Douglas, Julio and Sin. Maybe he might have swapped Julio, the, the, the other two members of the New Church in the Gathering. Well, um, Slash got pinned by Julio, so I assume. Vampiro comes out after the match. Wearing a real cool jacket, by the way. Yeah. He's a cool guy. Cool looking dude. Raven had a cool jacket, too, for the the Douglas blow-off. Mm-hmm. So they do a big hanging angle, Liam. It looks crazy. So they, 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 because they're tied by dog collars, the members of the new church and Douglas go to like the top of the rafters and pull the dog collars up so that they're hanging Raven and CM Punk in particular. Julio's a little late to the game there. They show up at the end to hang Julio too. But particularly Raven and it Punk. just gets in like before they end the stream too. <laughs> it's like the show is over, but the Julio's hanging too. Oh no, poor Julio got hung for nothing really. But Raven and Punk are like dangling from the rafters. They do like a full on hanging spot. It's brutal. It does look pretty intense. So that's our final angle of the month in the story as we build toward Raven versus Vampiro. Mm-hmm. Still the best thing going in this company. This entire story, Raven and the New Church. It's because Raven's the best thing in the company. That's true. He is like a proper real baby face. Mm. So we will go to Styles and Dusty next, which is the, the, the NWA title program that they start building toward on NWA TNA preview number 62, in which we have to unfortunately start by talking about the return of Hot Rod Rowdy Roddy Piper. I didn't think he was bad on the first bit. No, he's terrible on the first bit. You were just distracted by the watch-along. <laughs> yeah, and he's cool jacket. 
So Piper comes out. He does have his cool jacket. He is still rowdy, rowdy Piper. That's the thing. He can ramble about bullshit for 20 minutes and I'll still be like, oh, Freddy Piper's cool. He gets, he's been getting away with it for decades. Like, literally decades at this point. Like, his entire WCW run is the same thing where it's just like, his promos are incomprehensible nonsense. Like, the man is just incoherent. He's not saying things that make a remote lick of sense, but he's rowdy, rowdy Piper. So who gives a shit? <laughs> so, like, it doesn't matter. This is, like, his first promo after he was dropped by WWE. He made the return to WWE at WrestleMania for the Vincent and, and Hogan match. And then did the Sean O'Hare managing thing through the summer. And then was dropped by WWE because he did an interview with a HBO show. Bryant Gumbel's HBO show where he talked about drug use and wrestling. And how sometimes he didn't like who he was as a wrestler. And WWE didn't like that, so they dropped him. <laughs> God forbid people admit their problems or their... Their, f- their feelings about the pro wrestling business. Yeah, because we don't want it to get better, and we just want to s- just brush it under the rug at all times. It's easier that way. So Piper comes out, and he starts kind of addressing the fact that WWE fired him. He talks about how uh, he did all he did in his career, and then a promoter lets him go, or something like that. He talks about how his son asked if he was a drug addict. He talked about how the NWA saved his life, and now he wants to be a part of the NWA rocket ship taking off. I have a favorite part about this promo is he's like, Am I here just to support my ego? Am I here to just ride the coattails of something new? Maybe. <laughs> I've done it before. I'll do it again. Uh, again, you admire the honesty. He's like, yeah, I, you know, maybe I am using this just to pump my name out again. I've done it before and I'll do it again. Mm. So eventually Piper is interrupted by Vince Russo. Your favorite. Russo standing on the announce desk and he's talking about how, like, what are you here for, Piper? Are you just here to leech off our success? You're just here to burn another bridge? You don't care about the NWA. You don't care about these young guys. And then, like, Piper starts talking about how, like, last time they were face-to-face, he made a mistake. And I thought he was actually going to talk about the Owen segment again, but no, he just talks about how he didn't kill Russo where he stood then. He should have been like, I don't care about the young guys. (laughs) Michael Shane, come out here and face me. So Vince Russo issues a, an ultimatum. It's him or Piper. So TNA can let Piper go or they can let Russo go. But if they let Russo go, AJ's going with them. And you know what that means. <laughs> that they're going to fire AJ Styles right here. <laughs> yeah, that's who I'd pick. So that's your show running angle. Later in the show, Russo comes out and he demands answers from Don Callis, I guess. Or Eric Watts. I don't know. <laughs> One of them. <laughs> Mm. They do try to clarify that this month. They do clarify that Eric Watts is in charge of wrestling matches and Don Callis is in charge of everything else. (laughs) Yeah, I like that we've finally got the the definition of what's happening. It only took, like, their third attempt to actually clarify this, but they finally, like, delineated what these two men do. (laughs) Yeah, because it was kind of important. So Russo comes out, he demands an answer before he's interrupted by the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. (laughs) Yes. Dusty is, like, such a better ambassador for, like, tradition and the legacy of the NWA than Piper is. Sorry, I got distracted because I'm reading the Ryback's Twitter account. Oh, for God. <laughs> Why are you reading Ryback's Twitter account in the middle of recording? <laughs> because I thought it'd be a funny interlude. <laughs> and am I wrong? You are. I hate the Ryback. Uh, the Ryback has tweeted, uh, I love listening to Ad Joe Rogan on Aspot. <laughs> for God's sake. <laughs> That's just a troll tweet, though. Mmm. Wishing everyone a great Monday. Hashtag hungry. Feed him more, Liam. He's hungry. Um, oh, he had COVID. That's unfortunate. Uh, peppermint tea has worked wonders for the lungs and have dropped the kick out immune, sis- uh, immune support down to once a day again. Appetite definitely down, though. Lost 10 pounds. Feed him more, Liam. The big guy's going to look nice and lean for his AEW debut tonight. <laughs> Feed him more. Feed him Isaiah Cassidy. I will now get off of... Ryback's Twitter account. I was just like, it, it's so funny that if I just start reading Ryback tweets. God damn it. He has never been in TNA. TNA. He has no relevance to this podcast. Shout, shout out to the Boogeyman for re-signing after we read his tweets. They should give him the Fiend gimmick. Yeah. He should just make the Boogeyman the Fiend. They should make him the Fiendess. Yeah. Anyway, you can go talk about whatever stupid shooting stuff you're talking about. Yeah, so Dusty Rhodes comes out and he's trying to talk AJ into leaving Russo. He's like, oh, you know, you represent honor, you represent tradition, that everyone in the world wants that belt, but uh, you have it, so you should you should represent it with integrity. Then he's like, but the fact that you have that belt means you get paid more than anybody else. And when you go to the pay window, what do you have to do with some of that money? Where does some of it go? And then Russo's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And then AJ's like, hmm. 
hmm, I have thought about what you have said, Justin Rhodes, and maybe I will turn on Vince Russo, but it's a swerve. I mean, it's this is the AJ character is that he always pretends he's listening to the, the right advice and then he just, he's like, no, swivel the hips, baby. Yeah, so they start beating down on Dusty. Piper tries to make the save, but he's dragged away by the red shirt security before. And like, embarrassingly dragged away. <laughs> Literally, like, dragged physically. And fair play to Piper, because usually when people are dragged away, it looks like they're not resisting. It looks like Piper's trying to like sandbag these dudes, dragging him away. <laughs> Like, his uh, kilt rides up. <laughs> it looks very comedic. Uh, and then eventually Jarrett comes out and makes the actual save for Dusty as we begin the build toward AJ Styles and Dusty Rhodes. I thought you meant we begin the build to AJ Styles and <laughs> Jeff Jarrett. Well, we're doing that too. We should mention on this show, AJ Styles did have an NWA World Heavyweight Championship defense against Jerry Lynn. It was fine. It was probably their best match, to be fair. You gave this match four and a quarter. Why are you saying it was fine? <laughs> I didn't really remember much about it when I remember. It's, you could tell mid-sentence that I was like, oh, wait, I actually thought this ruled. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nah, yeah, rocked. Jerry Lynn led an absolute gusher. Um, like, yeah. So much. to the, I, I, I legitimately thought, like, Douglas and Raven are like, well, what the hell, guys? <laughs> yeah, they must have been pissed about that. Blood is our thing. Yeah, this was their best match, actually. I still think the end of the first exhibition title match that you hate it was their, 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 the best match that they've had, but this is a good NWA title defense, and you're back on board with Styles-Lynn matches. What I'm hearing here, Liam, is that you would like to see more AJ Styles-Jerry Lynn matches? Um, I think we're, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> You've had your fill? We're good and we're done with this one. I did like before this match, they aired like a video package to like prop this up as like one of the, the iconic rivalries in TNA history so far that they're going back to. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Right. That they're, they're treating this match. that they, they didn't just throw it out like it's nothing, even though Lin has lost a bunch of matches, so I don't know why he's getting a title match. He literally lost the, the Super X Cup first round match to Chris Saban, and then gets a world title match the next week. But who, who can ask for that kind of continuity in TNA? I mean, if only. Yeah, bleeds a ton, Styles wins. <laughs> Story of the match. Would you get four to quarter? One of your favorite matches in TNA history. It yeah, banged. I think it was just the atmosphere of this. Like, this just felt... It It, it was probably the callbacks to, like, it being that such a big feud. Mm. And it felt, it, it felt like it kept that intensity. It felt like, um... I'm, I'm always a sucker for, like, old rivals going against each other again. Mm. It's a cool thing. So, NWA TNA baby number 63, September 24th. We had a bunch of stuff related to these stories that we're talking about. Let's start with the Piper interview that we mentioned. So, Mike today is interviewing Roddy Piper after he's been fired and banned from the Impact Zone, or banned from the Asylum, even. Okay, we have a problem. What's our problem? <laughs> My pizza has arrived early. <laughs> oh, you went, you went, you ordered a pizza now? Yeah. <laughs> what did you expect to happen? I thought it was going to take longer. We still at least would have had, like, 40 minutes left to record. Nah, it's alright, keep going. Just keep talking, be back. <sighs> this is the stupidest bit. It's not a bit. It's just you being unprofessional. Ordering pizza in the middle of a podcast recording. I thought he meant when he was actually watching the match. Not freaking literally as we were talking about the match. And then, like, our shows usually go three hours. What was he thinking? <sighs> just gonna just quietly stew now. Quietly get angry at Liam ordering pizza in the middle of our podcast recording. It's not like I have anything to do. You know? Not like I have any pizza. He's just taunting me with his pizza. I love uh, Roddy Piper's interview. I thought it was really great. Uh, very coherent. I understood everything that was said. As coherent as your pizza ordering strategy in the middle of podcasts. I honestly thought it would take way longer. How long does this pizza usually take to come? Like an hour. And how long did it take to come? 20 minutes. But how long do you think is left in our recording? I was hoping about 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God damn it! So yeah, Piper... Talks to Mike Tanay. He's utterly incoherent. As, as we mentioned, this, this promo was like heavily edited to try and make some degree of sense. And it still doesn't. He's talking about how like maybe they're right to get rid of him. Maybe it's okay. He's like, maybe I am too selfish. It's like, all right. Thank you for the permission. Like, TNA weren't in the wrong for this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, 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 they made the right decision here. So we're not meant to feel bad, sad for Piper. We're not meant to feel like mad about the fact that he was caught. It's it's actually just fine. I hope this is like the end of it. <laughs> and the end of Piper. We'll never see him again. Yeah, he's just like yeah, I get it. <laughs> Leaves. 
So the other story on the show was that Don Callis comes out and he's about to fire Jeff Jarrett because he got rid of Piper and now he's emboldened. So he comes out and he's like, Jeff Jarrett, you're... And then he's interrupted by Eric Watts. And then Mike Tanae is like, you're what? You're what? It's like, Mike. No, you're Watts. What do you think he was going to say? And even Don West is like, he was going to say he's fired, Mike. You could have, like at the end, he's like, well, he could have said suspended. It's true. So uh, the, the, the Eric Watts interrupts and then makes a bunch of matches for this show. Like five matches. Yeah, I, I, it, it speaks to Eric Watts' disorganization that he did not have matches made for the show already. I think he had them ready. He was just announcing them to the crowd. Okay, okay. You've given Eric Watts the benefit of the doubt. I always will. So that led to our... Ma- Are you eating the pizza now? No. Please don't eat on a podcast. I was going to make it a segment. <laughs> there is literally nothing worse in the world to the poor human being's ears that listen to the show than the sound of mouth noises while listening to a podcast. Yeah, my mouth was watering. That's what you were hearing. Because I was going to make it a whole segment. I was going to review the pizza. Mm. <laughs> well, we can do it now. I was going to wait till you was, until you had finished the bit. But here we go. No, you stay away from the pizza. I want to review it. No, you're not eating the pizza. So Eric Watts makes Dusty Rhodes versus AJ Styles in the Bunkhouse Brawl. Dusty does a promo about how he talks about how like AJ may be a main eventer and there there are legends in the business, but Dusty's an icon. So even if AJ's a legend killer, Dusty's an icon. Even though Kid Cash is the legend killer on the show, Dusty, not AJ Styles. Maybe he should be like, Gil, I'm the icon killer. <laughs> I hope that yeah, Dusty thought he was going to feud with Kid Cash and came up with this great promo and was like, I'm still going to do it, Daddy. Yeah, he should feud with Kid Cash. That should be the... Well, obviously, Kid Cash is wrapping up this storyline should be against Hogan. Mm. He's the true icon of wrestling, Daddy. Not you, Hulk Hogan. Yeah, basically. Uh, but Sting's the icon. There's so many icons. Who's your favourite icon? It probably is Sting. I can't think of a funny answer. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Watts? Yeah. Eric Watts is always your funny answer. Not true, necessarily. So we have a bunkhouse brawl between AJ and Dusty where they start backstage or they start back on the parking lot even where they're brawling around by Dusty's pickup truck. They brawl into the building. They have a, a perfectly fine functional match that's carried by Dusty. But it's, ah, this wasn't even a match. It's more of an angle. The, the match ends due to excessive spanking, Liam. Which is like, this is a bunkhouse brawl. Yeah. Dusty eventually grabs AJ and spanks his bare bottom. <laughs> nice. Like... Hell of an ass on the kid. Yeah, to be fair, AJ, a lot going on for him. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. This kind of just pissed me off because I wanted to see AJ and Dusty wrestle. Well, that's what we're building to. This is what they promised me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Trinity tries to interfere and then Dusty spanks Trinity too. Man, poor Trinity. Just like all up in her on this <laughs> one. <laughs> Clearly, Dusty was more interested in spanking the ass of Trinity than spanking the ass of AJ. Uh, equal opportunity spanking AJ does a promo after the match where he's not happy about Dusty spanking his butt he's like you may enjoy spanking men's butts but I don't not me that's not a thing I enjoy well open your mind (laughs) the spanking community (laughs) the spanking community AJ takes like the most pointless little shot at Triple H I've ever seen in my life for like no reason there's no context to his character I guess the idea here is like that Vince is his Stephanie (laughs) Right? Like, that's what he was going for here, right? I have always thought of Vince Russo as the Stephanie McMahon of NWA TNA. You know what? Not wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, his little shot is like, I-, I didn't get respect by marrying the boss's daughter. I got respect by earning it. You made a really good point about this, where it was like, this was just everyone's go to shot from like 2003 to 2010. Mm. <laughs> Take a shot at Paul. To be fair, he was also going through one of the most annoying top runs in history, so... It's true, he was unbearable in the middle of 2003. So, you know. So, this promo is to build up the idea that AJ is so flustered and frustrated by Dusty spanking him that he challenges Dusty to an NWA world title match, but Vince Russo comes out and intervenes. He's like, no, 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 no. Man, Vince Russo has a toxic boyfriend. <laughs> He's like, we can't possibly have that. What we'll have instead is it'll be Dusty and Jeff Jarrett versus AJ Styles and me. Well, I imagine that everyone was desperate to see. No one wants to see AJ and Dusty. Everyone wants to see Vince Russo involved. I'm sure he'll bring up the quality of the match a ton. <laughs> the, the real work. What's workers. Vince Russo's best match? I don't know. Like, Was it like the cage match where he won the belt actually good? I have never seen it. Not a big WCW fan. You, know, you gotta watch WCW 2000. You gotta suffer pay me <laughs> uh, a very important note that I didn't mention in that Watts promo earlier he did mention that Jeff Jarrett will get his world championship match in, in the next 30 days yeah it's, a, it's some very specific wording there 
Mm. So AJ and Dusty is your feud. AJ and Russo against Jarrett and Dusty is your first main event of next month that you will look forward to us talking about in the next episode. I like how they, um, by the end of this month, they're like, first show, let's prove how good wrestling can be by itself. And at the end of it, they're like, haha, silly. You said this last show of the month was good. I enjoyed it. The wrestling wasn't great. I thought this show stunk. I thought every match on that last show of the month sucked. I thought the angles were bad. Yeah, I liked one match on this show a lot. So, X Division stuff for the month. We began with the Super X Cup, of course, which Chris Saban won. Then we followed with a six-man tag team match on NWA TNA pay number 62, in which Nasawa, Michael Shane, and Chris Saban faced uh, Frankie Kazarian, Juventud Guerrera, and the debuting Eric Young. David Young. It did say David Young on his lower third. But, yeah, Eric Young. Showtime Eric Young making his debut here in September 2003. He didn't actually do much of note in the match itself. He got to hit his cool move. Oh, he did. He hit the wheelbarrow neckbreaker, which is legitimately one of my favorite wrestling moves. That move rocks. Do you like it because it's Eric Young's move, or do you like it because of the move? I like it because of the move. It's a cool move. I remember it always had such impact in the video game. Mm. That, was, that always felt like a big finish in the video game. So the big story in this six-man tag team match is that the, the heel team won, the Sawa Saban and Michael Shane won, because Frankie Kazarian was distracted at ringside, Liam, talking to a girl. Ooh. And not just any girl, Liam. You might have recognized the girl to be Angelina Love. Angel Williams? That was her indie name at the time, yeah. Yeah, and she stayed there the whole show. Yeah, because the, the Raven and Shane Douglas brawl in her direction in the main event, and she's just sitting there. <laughs> trying not to get bled on. <laughs> Which is, I think, the main goal when you go to an NWA TNA show, just try not to be bled on. Or puked on. <laughs> There's a lot of bodily fluids that can end up on you at an NWA TNA show. <laughs> a few less since Bruce left. So this is the... <laughs> uh, or Puppet. You can choose one or the other, really. Well, Puppet might be Watermelon or whatever the hell he broke over that dude's head. Bit of everything. So this is the beginning of Frankie Kazarian's heel turn. He is He's too big of a ladies' man at ringside to actually focus on the match they're having. Much like the Sandman. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, the Sandman and Frankie Kazarian. Two people who I think of hand in hand. <laughs> Maybe they'll show us some hand in hand. <laughs> You've gotten the pizza and now you become unhinged. I haven't eaten it yet. <laughs> it's the hunger. It's just staring at me. The hunger has made the hunger and the smell has driven you to insanity. A little bit. End of TNA baby number twenty four. We had a number one con- uh, sorry number fifty three September twenty fourth. We had a number one contenders match as Jerry Lynn, Hubertu Guerrero, Nasawa, uh, Frankie Kazarian, and Chris Sabin faced off in an ele- elimination match to determine the next contender for Michael Shane's championship. Nasawa was robbed. They did misspell Nasawa in the video package for the match. They said Nasawa. Yeah, come on, Jeremy. Listen, I know you've been up for 25 hours doing this. But you will get the name of the sour right. He's the chief strategy officer. Frankie Gazarian came out. He went over to the, the TNA girl and started flirting with her. Lollipop, thank you. Yes, of course. She has a name. And a new haircut. Yeah, don't you, don't you correct me about Lollipop when you didn't even recognize her in the watch-along. I recognized her by the end of it. She only did her ass high spot. And then you're like, oh, it's Lollipop! <laughs> Well, that's her most known for spot. Would you blame someone if there was someone wearing a disguise and then they hit the Stone Cold Stunner and you're like, oh, it's Stone Cold Steve Austin. It's Shark Boy. <laughs> it's Glenn Gilberti. Not at this point. <laughs> well, you could tell the difference, I'm sure. Uh, so Frankie was flirting with her. Let's talk about Frankie's hair. Let's talk about Frankie's test gear. Yeah, let's talk about Frankie. Frankie and his big test tights. And his pitch black hair. Yeah, why is he dyeing his hair so black? I didn't mind it, but... uh He's just gone through some phases here. Yeah, he's trying to work out who he is. Don't blame him. It's like, what does a ladies' man look like? That's the thing. He's like, he hit puberty. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I like girls, it's not just wrestling. So what do I look like to attract girls? Yeah, this is actually the whole story of Frankie Gazarian trying to lose his virginity. Yeah, by looking like Test. I mean, listen, I'm sure Tess, it worked for Test. He had that whole thing with Stephanie. Yeah. Frankie needs to link up with Vince Russo. <laughs> that was about to go to the same place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this match had one of my biggest pet peeves about elimination matches, where there are people breaking up pinfalls. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing? Who cares? <laughs> yeah, the, this match was a match. Jerry Lynn won. Uh, the most notable thing is the most about the match. Uh, Hubinto Guerrero was originally booked to win the X Division number contenders match at Wrestle Shane for the title. However, they got word that he's got visa problems and weren't confident he'd be able to make it. Guerrero, like so many others, has been using a tourist visa, which means you aren't allowed to work. He was stopped at the border and had, had has been explaining if they see his wrestling outfit that he's looking for a job that he's not working. Imagine that must be terrifying every time you cross the border, wasn't it? Yeah, it reminds me of the Chris Hero story. 
he was warned that if he tries it again, he, they'll never let him back into the country. Like, every time you go to work there, it's like, oh god, if I'm caught, I might be kicked out forever. Well, all the Canadians who were trying to work PWG at the time. Bailey and Smash Brothers and stuff, you know? Mm. Must be a very difficult thing to go through. It's very silly. Yeah, borders. Why do we have them? Yeah, tear down all the borders. Imagine there's... what's the, There's a line about borders in that song. Um, <laughs> in Imagine. Imagine there's no borders. That's definitely the line. You could if you tried. That might actually be the line. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to sing it so perfectly that we may get copyrighted. Oh, no. Uh, control F. Borders. Garrett, I, I regret to inform you. There is no borders in here. There is, there is the line, in fact, imagine there's no countries. There you go. That's what I'm going for. It isn't hard to do. Which was more or less what you just Nothing said. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion to. Ah. Imagine all the people living life in peace. <laughs> that's our exhibition stuff for the month. Let's move on to tag teams. That's, that, that, that's worth a bite of pizza, surely. <laughs> no. Ah. You can't have pizza until we're done. Imagine there's no restriction on Liam eating pizza. The more you sing, the longer it takes for you to eat pizza. <laughs> it's easy if you <laughs> try. NWA TNA baby number 62, September 17th. We had a number one contenders match open the show. The Tree Live Crew Face, America's Most Wanted, The New Church, and Kid Cash and Abyss. The most, of course, exciting part of this was the promise of music. <laughs> ah, yes, we've been promised that next week, 3LK will debut their new song. Oh, I was devastated to learn this was not the theme song. <laughs> uh, yeah, they have multiple theme songs. Which also, like, I don't know, this might be like the first wrestling like group to actually just release multiple legitimate songs. <laughs> yeah, this is Three Live Crew, We Be Rockin' Like This, that one. That's the song they debut as opposed to This Mother Is A Bad Jam, which I think is the one this you're looking for. This Mother Is A Bad Jam. Do, 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 do. Right, we'll get to that one day. But I actually didn't mind this match. Yeah, it was high energy, a lot of bumps, a lot of action, just guys just going at a million miles an hour. That, like, that's when this show is good, when people work fast with urgency and intensity and, and like energy. It's like, oh, it's good. And then when guys just, just do nothing and sit there and grab a headlock, it's less good. It helps that the best tag team in the company were also in this. Kick okay, Cash and Abyss? That was literally the joke I was about <laughs> to make. Uh, the distinctly wet Abyss? Yeah, you stay wet. Uh, Terry Taylor came out, hit Kid Cash with a low blow twice, which I quite enjoyed. Yeah, it was a good little spot there. Allowing 3LK to pick up the win and become number one contenders of the tag titles. Cool. So they were meant to get that shot the next week, but Johnny Swinger had an emergency appendectomy, so he was not available. Uh, well, do you want to talk about the Diamond Swinger match on the same show? Let's do Shark Boy and Mikey separate. Okay. I wasn't sure there was more to that. <laughs> oh yeah, they get beat up as well. Hmm. So we'll go to the six-man tag on the next show. So, like, it's meant to be... Di- they debut the song, Liam, the song that you did, you thought it would be a different song, but it wasn't the song you wanted it to I was, be. I was devastated, actually. Heartbroken. So, uh, Diamond Swinger and... Da- uh, sorry, not Swinger. Diamond Gilberti and David Young interrupt Tree LK. They beat them up because, as mentioned, Swinger had an emergency happened act and we missed the show. I, f- I found it funny how they kind of dressed David Young as... Johnny Swinger. Yeah, they made him look like him. It's a, hopefully people won't notice. He's like, wear the Johnny Swinger pants and hope, we'll just, just hope you get away with it, okay? They should, have give, they should have given him a wig and just had him be Johnny Swinger. <laughs> so they do say that he had the emergency after attack to me. He won't be there tonight. Uh, Eric Watts makes a six-man tag match between Diamond Swinger and... Not Swinger. Young. Young Gilberti and diamond and 3lk saying diamond and swinger is too like broken into my brain so i'm not going to complain about david young being added to a match but like why didn't they just do diamond and gilberti yeah that was against two of 3lk that would make a lot more sense but i guess the idea here was that like 3lk won but like the tag champs weren't there so they couldn't actually defend it or whatever yeah and then for some reason 3lk lost the six-man tag though okay there's no reason i thought they won for some reason i thought they they picked up the win maybe because that's the obvious thing to do uh (laughs) where they beat the the the, the not team and then deserve more of a shot against the team i don't know this was a weird one instead for some reason uh gilberti hits pg with a chair and gilberti diamond and young pick up the victory and young won too so maybe it was like meant to be the swerve of it was that young got the pin I will say I didn't care much for the match because they actually... Like, Tree LK should work five-minute matches every time and there should be sprints. There should be no selling. There should be no heat segment. They should just do moves. Okay, you didn't care for the match. I didn't care for the performance. <laughs> so Tree LK have let us down in every regard on the show. Yeah. Uh, when when BG James is the second best rapper in the group, you have a problem. <laughs> Heavy shot at Ron killing. <laughs> Did you hear Conan's part in this? 
No, well, I did, but I don't really remember it. He was just, he, it sounded like he had, didn't want to be a part of it. He's like, uh, and he was, and he left. <laughs> he did like. Conan has had rap albums though, hasn't he? Apparently he didn't want to be a part of this. <laughs> He's embarrassed by having to rap next to BG, which to be fair, who wouldn't? Hey, BG dropped bars. <laughs> if he was embarrassed, then he shouldn't be because uh, BG showed him up here. You're saying BG's a better musician than Conan? Yes. Oh. At this, well, listen, he's got that chart-topping country uh, hit as well, so... BG James is killing it on all facets. Every genre is BG James Oyster. <laughs> the only other feud in the tag team division was on NWA TNA pay-per-view number 63, September 24th, through the match between the black shirt security and the red shirt security. <laughs> are man. you calling this the tag division? <laughs> well, it's a tag team match between two tag teams. These are, are these tag teams? They're the red shirt security and the black shirt security, Liam. Where's the APA? Kevin Northcutt and the, the other guy whose name I can't remember against Rick Santel and Chris Vaughn. <laughs> Ryan Wilson. Ryan Wilson. Oh, Triton, of course. How could I leave out Triton? Yes. Triton. Which we will cover in a year and a half. Um, yeah, this match sucked. Uh, two more, it was so long. It was. again, like, And the match was probably only like six minutes, but it's like, God, guys, just go straight to a finish. What a drag of the fucking heat segment this was. Mm. I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, is this going 12 minutes? <laughs> and it was all heat segment. And then after the heat segment, the black security fight back and then just get beaten up again. Yeah, and then Eric Watts shows up, helps the red shirt security win. Chris Vaughn gets his Well, that's why I gave an extra quarter star. Because <laughs> Watts was there. Yeah. It's not very unbiased of Eric Watts, by the way. Well, you know, but to be fair, the red shirts aren't exactly getting unbiased treatment from Don, so... I will say, when Eric Watts interfered and then Chris Vaughn won, Don West shouted at the top of his lungs, There is a god. So I'm pretty sure he just called Eric Watts god. <laughs> I told you, Watts is god. <laughs> So that's our tag team stuff. Like, all the other programs this month are very truncated, very much setting up contenders for title matches that don't really happen because we only have two other shows up than the Super X Cup show. Yeah. Uh, Which is best of the rest, starting with Jarrett and Daniels. They finally had their maybe blow-off match. I don't think they wrestled again after this. it was fine. (laughs) Again, you defended this NWA TNA pay-per-view number 63. You defended this September 24th show, and it's just all these matches that are bad. I think think they're bad. I just think they're whatever. (laughs) So on the the week before, Christopher Daniels has recruited minions. Yeah, the altar boys. No, altar boy Luke. Yeah, I think one of them is um, what's his name? Spider Nate Webb. Spider Nate Webb, indeed. The the more gaunt looking, most gaunt looking, ghostly man you've ever seen in your life. The one who takes the balcony dive. Yes. So Jeff Jarrett Daniels recruits his minions and says, "Go after Jarrett." They find Jarrett. Jarrett beats him up and throws Nate Webb off a balcony through a table. Yeah. Hey, Web rules. I actually hope we get to see him in some of these X Division stuff. He does a bunch of explosion stuff. I'm not sure does he do much on the actual shows themselves. He probably pops up here and there. Did he show up in something else before? In TNA? Yeah. He might have been in one of the, like, the wacky multi man. I think he might have been, because I think I remember talking about him before. So then you did have the Jarrett and Daniels match, where Daniels had all his minions, but instructed them not to interfere, but then his minions did interfere, and Jarrett and Daniels lost. It seems like such a swing and a miss not to have Ultra Boy Luke in this. <laughs> <laughs> like literally it's so- and he's been on the show like within the last like month you had an altar boy on the show you should have done spider night web matt seidel and altar boy luke as the minions i was like i'm not sure was it like a makeup job or something but the minions looked like the palest most like malnourished as malnourished as you are without your pizza at the moment uh people <laughs> in the you're, gonna make me, you're gonna make me bite it like mid thing Listen, we only have like five more things to do and then we're done. Then you can eat your pizza. I'm, I've picked up a piece and I'm just smelling it now. <laughs> just to get some sense of pizza. It's going to lick it. <laughs> but yes, they looked as malnourished as you do without your pizza right now. Yeah. Um, the most important thing I think here is the the candle continuity. Oh, well, go on. Well, uh, as we... There was a big feud with James Mitchell and Raven, which began with um, the misappropriation of candles and occultic symbols. So I assume James Mitchell will be coming for for Christopher Daniels next. And who knows what beast Christopher Daniels has unleashed into the the asylum through his uh, his um, un unwieldy uh, usage of the dark arts. We'll have to keep an eye out next month to see who shows up and who debuts, and that's who Daniels has summoned. If, If Judas Macias comes in, I swear to God. So, uh, yeah, Jarrett won the match. Daniels whipped, uh, I think it was Nate Webb that he whipped, wasn't it? It's, it's just a shame it was all on. Let's give Nate Webb all the credit. Yeah, Nate Webb is the only one of these minions that matters, except for uh, Tiny Luther. Actually, I don't think it was Nate Webb. I think it was the other guy. So, not Nate Webb, not Tiny Luther, the third one? Yeah. <laughs> Ultra Boy Luke, we'll call him. Jarrett has ended his feud with Daniels. He has beaten them in their one match. What a 
uneventful feud that they had. Yeah, Daniels needs some serious rehab after this. Let's go to Kid Cash and Terry Taylor. Perfect match. So they had the segment on the Super X Cup show where they had the backstage interview. Then they had the seg- the segment where Terry Taylor cost Kid Cash the number tag team number contenders match. And then on NWA TNA pay per view number. 63, last show of the month, they had a match against each other. Kid Cash, Terry Taylor. I will say backstage interview, Terry Taylor was wearing the Bobby Roode robe. Yeah, I, I thought I made note of that. And Okay, this might have just been my eyes playing tricks on me, right? But I swear to God, in the middle of his hair, it was red tinted. I didn't notice, but w- why would it be? Because he's the Red Rooster. Ah, that's, that's storytelling. But I swear to God it was there. And I was like, there's no way he keeps that up for appearances. Why would he? That's a terrible gimmick. He must regret that every day of the fucking year. But like, I swear to God it was red. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he just does it when he's having matches. Maybe. I, I, would, I would be legitimately impressed if he kept that for any reason. But I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> So Terry Taylor's big thing here is that he had AMW out with him to even the odds. Abyss interferes, hits Terry Taylor with a black hole slam, but then AMW sorted things out. Terry Taylor won. Yeah, good fun. Nice little blow-off, I assume, to this Kid Cash against Legends feud. Uh, Well, the the blow-off is that to be a legend beats him, surely. Well, Taylor beat him, so there you go. Oh, yeah, but he still stood tall at the end. Need like uh like Dusty coming in and laying him out. Mm. Or Hogan, either of (laughs) them. Hogan and Kid Cash. (laughs) Yeah. The second last thing, Sonny Siaki against D'Lo Brown. Most notable, because they had a casket match on NWA TNA Baby number 62, for the debut of Umaga. Um, I'm ecstatic about this. Mm. Umaga, legitimately, maybe my favorite big man wrestler of all time. His WWE run is one of my favorite things in wrestling. I have gone back and watched the highlights so many ridiculous amount of times. Uh, just legitimately one of my favorite wrestlers. I'm very excited for this. Um, and he looked like a fucking badass. Yeah, so they're having a casket match. They're doing their usual casket match. It's every casket match you've ever seen, where the, the entire drama is just built around somebody shutting a lid. I don't know why these matches still exist. And um, threw him on top of it, which is kind of gnarly. Yeah, and they, he broke the door. <laughs> and then they're just kind of like, yep, that counts. Because yeah, the the, the, the the lid of the casket was broken in two, so the, the, the top half came off. Uh, Jamal of Three Minute Warning fame, uh, Ekmo Fatu as he'll go by in TNA, or Maga as he'll go on to be in WWE, showed up, dropped Dilo with a big Samoan drop, and then helped Siaki throw him he in. He looks so good, didn't he, already? It was so sick. Because he's, like, big and cool and does cool moves. And, yeah, they threw Dilo in the casket. And as mentioned, they kind of had to just place the top of the casket in the right place. But let's talk about that. They're even cooler segment. Where they beat up some guys that we will talk about now, which is Sharkboy and Mad Mikey. That's a new tag team. As I like to call them, Sharkboy and Lava Girl. Mad Sharky. Ah, oh, that's pretty good. That's actually not bad. <laughs> so, September 17th, Sharkboy's backstage playing with a robot, Mad Mikey. They have a tag team match against Diamond and Swinger. Mad Mikey's not pleased about Sharkboy's antics. Well, to be fair, he does say that um, I also like to play with <laughs> inflatable things in my own time, but I do keep it to my own time. Yeah, this is professional time, Shark Boy. You don't want to be inflating with inflatable things on professional time. Sorry, I'm, I am I just checked ECMO's cage match, yeah. and I am truly uh, in love with how many times ECMO wrestles <laughs> in TNA. I think he has a match nearly every week in October, so... I'm, I'm very excited. Him and Sonny Siaki as a tag team. I, there's one match on here I am very excited for. Well... You can look. I think that's his last one. I imagine that's the one you're talking about. No. <laughs> oh, interesting. He comes back in 2004. Yeah, that, that's the match I would have been taught that you were talking about because it's Alex Shelley, isn't it? What is? <laughs> it's Umaga against Alex Shelley. <laughs> Sorry, my head hurts. You'll have to wait a year to cover that one. How does he go from not wrestling for that long in this company? And pop it up to face Alex Shelley randomly. Does he just hang around? I don't think so. I think he just works Japan a lot. All right. Well. We'll see. So, Sharkboy and Mike, uh, Mad Mikey face Diamond and Swinger, they lose. Yeah. Let's talk about Mad Mikey's outfit. Uh, what was his outfit? It was Spongebob. Oh, right. You went to the next show. NWA TNA and Baby Numbers 24. They're backstage. Sharkboy and Mad Mikey are together. Mad Mikey is wearing a Spongebob costume. He is not pleased. Why is he wearing a Spongebob costume? Yeah. How did we get to the stage where he put on the Spongebob costume before he realized he does not want to wear a Spongebob costume? He also tore it apart. Like, it was... It was disintegrated before he even put it on. Clearly, he's not a fan of Shark Boy's antics. But he lives in a pineapple under the sea. Maybe that's, does Shark Boy come from Bikini Bottom? Canonically, um, yes. Oh, cool. 
I think this story is actually secretly very sad. Because Sharkboy just wants to have friends? Yeah, Sharkboy had his best friend, New Jack, who'd play all the games with him. And then he like, he, he was fired by Don Callis. And now he's just wandering lonely, looking for a new friend. Looking for a pod. He lost his friend Norman Smiley because they, they wouldn't pay him. He's gone too. Now he's just like, this Mad Mikey guy is mean to me, but he's all I have. If um, TNA wanted money, mm-hmm. they would have done an angle called Finding New Jack. And it would have been Sharkboy traveling across America to find New Jack. Traveling the ocean all the way down to Australia to find him there. Yeah, that's where he is. He's, in, he's wrestling in WWE. Because let's not forget Finding Nemo set in Australia. Oh, trust me, I would not forget that. <laughs> yeah, that Mad Mikey and Sharkboy yeah, segment where they dressed as SpongeBob ended with Ekmo and Sunny Siaki beating the shit out of them. No. Likely setting up a match for next week. Now I'm just sad about it. <laughs> about Sharkboy's inability to find friends. Yeah. He needs a super friend. Mm-hmm. All right, that's everything for the month. Let's go show by show real quick. If you have any notes from the Super X Cup show that you haven't covered. That it was the best show in company history. And like all the the hype was like, it was the best show in company history as well. Like the, the Dave Meltzer was talking about it, like all the reports he got was like, this was the best show this company has ever put on. And I like how they're just like, let's not do more of this. <laughs> and like even Meltzer was like, maybe even one of the best pay-per-views, like single pay-per-views ever. Which is like, all right, maybe a bit too far there, Dave. I mean, maybe 03, who knows? We'll, we'll take the praise. It feels like um, like a really good dynamite. One of those dynamites where it's just like, match, interview, match, interview, match, interview, match, interview. It's like, why can't the show always be this good? I will say, uh, Dave Meltzer was like cataloging the feedback he got for the one cent pay-per-view because uh, he got a bunch of more feedback from people who'd never watched TNA before. Oh, did his did these female friends talk about how there was too much blood? <laughs> yes, of course. All his female friends were like, we watched these Jarrett and Raven matches and there was blood everywhere and I would never watch this NWA TNA. <laughs> but one of the notes he did actually mention that came up a bunch was that people hated Don West. How dare they? Like, like Don West, for some reason, was hated by wrestling fans. All, like, all the way through this run, like, Don West was always derided. Even though, like, Don West was a good announcer by, like, September 2002 you know like he wasn't yeah. he was good pretty fast and even like by now September 2003 I'd say he's already a great announcer yeah I think he's definitely come into it at this point he's just like full on into it he's like a proper real great wrestling announcer and him and Tanea are a tremendous team who perfectly complement each other I guess maybe like just playing devil's advocate maybe it's like he's too loud but he's not even like especially when you compare him to like Pat McAfee now well, I don't think the 2003 people were comparing him to Pat McAfee. But, like, people are always like, you know, oh, Pat McAfee's like Don West. Like, Don West spends 95% of shows talking at a normal volume. And then Amazing Red comes out. And he goes nuts. When something that happens that's worth going nuts over, he goes nuts. But otherwise, he's just talking to Mike Tanay. He's not, like, shouting all the time. Where did the people get this impression that he's shouting all the time? Maybe he was shouting all of these matches because these matches deserve shouting. Hmm. <sighs> Stupid people. Stupid people that are Don West slander. These casuals. Horrible fans. They don't deserve Don West. We didn't deserve the, the, the tremendous commentator that was Don West from 2002 to 2009. NWTNA baby number 62. I didn't mention the, the, the call of Mike Tanay at the end of that show where he's like, this sucks. This is BS. I've lost my oct- objectivity and I don't give a damn. So good. Mike Tanay just like burying the actions of these despicable heels in a way that feels like authentic and organic and not like natural yeah he's not like performing he legit like Don West takes his headset off and throws it down he's so upset and Mike Tanay's like oh, I don't blame you this is BS it's like ah oh, that's just great announcing to go back to Don West and Mike Tanay great announcers yeah but he's too bloody loud <laughs> <laughs> and I'm talking about Mike Tanay <laughs> Uh, I did enjoy JB's little um, tag team split screen thing in the opening video. I like the, their little logos. L- that was fun. Look at these little entrance logos. Good job, JB. Again, 17th straight hour <laughs> he spent putting that together. And then we're taking baby number 63. My favorite part that we didn't talk about was Jerry Lynn's backstage interview. <laughs> Destroy your competition. I think it was, I wrote it down wrong then I was, I believe it was opposition he said. Did he say opposition? Are those a competition? I have opposition on the notes I took while watching the show and competition from the notes I have here. So I think it was opposition. I'll trust my in the moment notes more than my uh, after the fact notes. Another t-shirt we need to parody. Destroy the opposition. Yeah, and it just has like the logos of a bunch of other wrestling podcasts X'd out. Listen, I'm going to cut Mr. Nerd from the intro for this episode. <gasps> I know it's quite devastating. To add the I've lost my objectivity and I don't give a damn. But I 
do not support this. Nonetheless, as a compromise for Jerry Lynn, I will also add the destroy the opposition. I think destroy the opposition should be our closer. This is just so Jerry continues that reference. You see, the Mr. Nerd is the longest quote, so it's the one that that is easiest to cut. Um, We should should add the destroy the opposition after the intro. (laughs) Like, it's the last thing that they hear. (laughs) At the very end of the episode? Yeah, no, no, yes. (laughs) That's what I meant originally, yes. So it's like, bye! Destroy the opposition! <laughs> we will close this episode with Jerry Lynn's Destroy the Opposition. I meant permanently. <laughs> oh, Jerry. He's just a cool metal dad. <laughs> I want to go to... Uh, I was going to say Metallica, but that's Celatica. I want to go to Megadeth concerts with Jerry Lynn. Mm. Uh, there was multiple brawls where Scott Hudson was calling, like, play-by-play on the brawls. Yeah, it was weird. He did, like, over-the-mic commentary and then threw back as soon as they entered the asylum. Yeah, it happened twice. It happened with the Jarrett beating down Daniel's, like, uh, ministry people. And it happened with the Styles and Dusty brawl backstage where eventually they went back into the building, as you mentioned, and he threw it back to Tanae and West. It was weird. Yeah. I didn't like it. Scott's like, I'm a play-by-play guy. I want to do play-by-play. And this is their, like, compromise. But I'm on an, like, explosion. <laughs> we'll let you do a little bit of play-by-play. Just a tiny little play-by-play. That's a treat. All right, that's all the notes I have. And Rick Santel died. Oh, well, he didn't. He... Not literally. Like, <laughs> his shoulder. <laughs> he separated. <laughs> yeah, he separated his shoulder in the match against the, the red shirt. Or the black shirt. Your red shirt security, he's black shirt. So. My only note that I have is this bloody pizza looking scrumptious. <laughs> Well, you're about to eat it when I finish the outro. That is September 2003. Thank you so much for listening. Follow us on Twitter at TNA History Pod. Follow me on Twitter at Jared Kidney. Follow Liam on Twitter at The Muda. Support us on Patreon. If you enjoy the show, we have a lot more content on Patreon now. A lot more content. We have like, I think, 50 odd like exclusive pieces of audio on Patreon, including our latest Q&A, including our series covering Rinka King, our full series covering the 2010 Monday Night Wars, and our watch-alongs for uh, this month. We did this, the NWATNA baby number 62, the September 17th show with the hair versus hair match. A real good one. Uh, yeah, I thought like the two shows this month, the Super X Cup and that September 17th show rocked. And then I thought the last show of the month kind of sucked. So I was very disappointed. I meant our live reaction. <laughs> Oh, it was a great episode of the live reaction? Yeah. You were putting us over rather than putting TNA over? Yeah, not, I would I will never put TNA over. <laughs> but yeah, I liked the first two shows of this month a lot, and then the last one kind of sucked. I was very disappointed that I couldn't go. This was the best month in TNA history because it had a bad show. This is the best month in TNA history. Boom. So you can go to tnachad.com or patreon.com slash kidding me. You can support us there where you can get all that content and you can enjoy it. We're in the top 25% of Patreons, apparently, according to Brandon Thurston's research. Of all time? All Patreons? That's crazy. Uh, of current wrestling Patreons, we're in the top 25%. So you can be a top 25%er by supporting us on Patreon. Put us in the top 20. <laughs> Not just up there. Come on. We should probably mention the Patreon at the start. We probably should. Shouldn't bury it We should make a little ad in. for it. We should make. We should do like an interrogators bit, right? Where you're interrogating me and you're like, what is the best way to spend your money on TNA related content? I'm like, uh, t- uh, tnachat.com. <laughs> yeah, we'll make a bit. <laughs> we'll find a bit. I forgot to mention, I meant to mention for a couple of weeks, our, our pals Days of Thunder are now on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We did a crossover episode with them over Christmas, watching the World Wrestling All-Stars uh, Inception event, which was a horrible show, worse than anything TNA has ever produced. But uh, Days of Thunder, if you'd like to hear a podcast covering thunder, one thunder at a time, that's your show for you. It's now, if you listen to this show in the main Voices of Wrestling feed, uh, that show will also be in the Voices of Wrestling feed. Or if you listen to this show in our own personal feed, you can go look for Days of Thunder on the podcast platform of your preference. Go listen to Days of Thunder. Yeah, and uh, Jumping Bomb Audio. <laughs> yeah, and Through the Years, where you can hear the, the Ring of Honor equivalent of our show. <laughs> that's not on our network. <laughs> Let's just plug everybody's shit. Um, yeah, let's, okay, let's name wrestling podcast. You can go listen to Deadlock. Uh, 52 <laughs> What? <laughs> the Eric Bischoff show. The what? <laughs> the Eric Bischoff podcast. No, no, no. <laughs> we don't plug Eric Bischoff I, here. Um. Oh, brand new show to the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network, the Emerald Flow show covering Old Japan and Noah. Yeah. Music of the Mat, the best show on the network because it has uh, put us both on it. Only if it has TNA themes, though. There's a lot of Dale Oliver slander on that show, though. How dare they? Super J cast. I'm literally going through the feed. <laughs> I don't want to forget anyone. <laughs> Open the voice gate. There's that new uh the, the four pillars, the new AEW show. Oh yeah, the fifth pillar. 
Oh yeah, that's what it's called. There you go. I know names of shows. Uh, shake them ropes. Yeah, shake them ropes. You can listen to Post Wrestling. That's that's a different network. Um, not WrestleNomics. They betrayed us. Well, that's over there on Post Wrestling now. Hey, Brandon. Damn it. Um. <laughs> All right, that's the show. Yeah, this show. Just listen to this yeah, show. Listen to You've Got to Be Kidding Me. Go back and listen to old episodes if You've Got to Be Kidding Me. What more do you want than You've Got to Be Kidding Me? I'm actually going to keep this going just so Liam can't eat his, eat his pizza. Ah! <laughs> disgusting disgusting behavior you should be fired you should be thrown in a river for this behavior anyway that's our show we'll be back in two weeks with the october 2003 episode of you've got to be kidding me we'll be back in about a week with I'm our working. god with our episode of uh ring cat king on patreon patreon.com slash kidding me or teenagehat.com thanks for listening and bye bye destroy the opposition